What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Uchiha and Uzumaki Hybrid, Part 6. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. No, it can't possibly be that Abido. You have already met a lot of people sharing the same name in the clan, so the name is common. Renjiro tried to console himself. Yes, he is very ambitious, he has not yet awakened his Sharingan, but he is already talking about becoming the Hokage. Can you imagine that? The first ever Achiha Hokage might be my son. Fujioka said, proudly puffing his chest. It is him. Rinjiro's mind blanked out for a second. He did not have a concise plan on how he was going to handle such events that were going to happen in the future, at least not yet. He was not sure whether he would step in and change certain things, or if he would just let things play out. There was a fear of uncertainty that Renjiro did not want to experience if the current events veered off the plot of the franchise. So he was leaning towards letting this play out as they did in the original story. But that is easier said than done. I am not sure if my experiences here will force me to step in. But I guess we will never know until we get there. Renjiro shrugged. I just need to focus on getting stronger as planned. If I become strong enough, things will become easier or at least clearer. Is there something wrong? Did I say something wrong? Seeing Renjiro suddenly become silent, Fujioka became alarmed. Are you okay Renjiro? Hearing Fujioka's voice, Renjiro was immediately brought out of his reverie. Ooh, I am fine. It is just that I have heard much of a boy like that from my friends in the academy. Renjiro lied through his teeth, he wasn't even sure what his friends from the academy were doing. That's good to hear, I can't wait for the day when my son becomes strong enough to be the Hokage, Fujioka remarked. Ooh, he will be, Renjiro thought, I am just not sure whether I would be prepared for that day. With that, Renjiro headed back home. It had been a bad start to the day for him as he received the varying yet impactful news from Fujioka. It was to the extent that Renjiro wasn't in the correct mind state to even continue with his Raisingan training. So he took a break for the rest of the day. In a chilly, rainy morning in Kanoha, the sky was overcast, heavy clouds hanging low as if sharing in the grief of the day. Pitter-patter. Raindrops pattered rhythmically against Renjiro's window, a steady rhythm that filled the room with a melancholic feeling. Renjiro got up and stared through his window, it seems like the weather is also grieving today. Today was the day they would give their final respects to Tobe, Toda, and the other three shinobis who had died while attacking the Kurigain clan settlement. Renjiro usually wore an all-black shirt and pants, that he had numerous sets of, paired with his green flak jacket. But today, he opted for the only pair of black robes he owned. The robes were not the usual heavy, ceremonial ones. They were light, allowing for comfortable movement, which was something Renjiro always appreciated. I am not sure I remember the last time I wore this. Is it the time I wore it during my Chunin celebration with the clan? As he held up the robes, Renjiro's eyes fell on the prominent Uchiha clan symbol embroidered on the back. The red and white fan stood out against the black fabric. This was a major reason why Renjiro rarely wore the robes. It wasn't that Renjiro was against his clan, he simply had never felt entirely comfortable displaying the symbol. Wearing it felt like assuming a mantle of responsibility and pride that he wasn't sure he fully embraced. Yet, for today's occasion, it seemed necessary for the occasion. Renjiro slipped into the robes, noticing with a sigh that they were getting smaller. I need to get another set of robes. Is it strange that my body is experiencing a growth spurt when I am only 11? Renjiro couldn't help but remark with a faint smile. The robes, which had once fit him perfectly, now felt a bit tight across the shoulders and shorter at the sleeves. After finishing up, Renjiro glanced around his room one last time. He took a deep breath and then stepped out of his home. The rain was a constant drizzle, creating a soft splash underfoot as he walked. 
He planned to head to Miwa's place. They had agreed to go together to pay their final respects to their fallen comrades. Navigating the empty streets of the Uchiha clan, Renjiro felt the weight of the day pressing down on him. The rain continued to fall, adding to the somber atmosphere. The streets were quiet, the usual bustling life muted by the rain and the somber mood hanging over the clan compound. Today was not only a sad day for those who had known the deceased Shinobi personally, but it was also a day of collective mourning for the entire Uchiha clan. The loss of Tobe, Toda, and the others was deeply felt, as they were all capable shinobi who had served their clan and village with honor. The Uchiha clan had a long-standing tradition of coming together to pay their final respects whenever one of their own was being laid to rest. It didn't matter whether the ties to the deceased were close or distant, the whole clan united in grief and honor. It was a show of solidarity and respect, a way to celebrate the lives and sacrifices of those who had fallen. While individuals could choose to forego a public burial if they wished, those who served in the military force had no such option. They were celebrated as heroes. It sucks sad that they are no longer here. They treated me like their own little brother. I just hope they get peaceful rest wherever they were. It felt surreal that they were gone, and the reality of their absence weighed heavily on him. He knew that today's ceremony was not just a formality but a deeply personal farewell for many. As he approached Miwa's place, Miwa was already waiting outside, her own expression mirroring the gravity of the day. She also wore similar robes that Renjiro was wearing. Morning, Miwa, Renjiro greeted her softly. Morning, Renjiro, she replied, her voice tinged with the same somber tone. Ready to go? Renjiro nodded, yes, let's go. They didn't spend much time at Miwa's place. As they walked together through the quiet streets. Renjiro, are you okay? Miwa asked, breaking the silence. Her voice was soft, but there was a depth of concern in her tone. Renjiro sighed, glancing at Miwa. It would be weird if I was fine, considering two people I considered friends died. Miwa nodded, her expression sympathetic. I know. It's just. It's hard to process. I didn't know the five shinobi who died very closely, but I still feel sad for their families. They were robbed of their loved ones. Renjiro looked down at the wet ground, yeah, it's hard. No matter how much we train or how strong we get, losing people never gets easier. Miwa nodded again, her eyes reflecting the same inner turmoil that Renjiro felt. It's the price we pay, I suppose. For being shinobi. They continued their journey in silence, each occupied by their own thoughts. As they neared the base, the atmosphere grew more charged with the presence of others gathering for the same purpose. Renjiro could see groups of shinobi and clan civilians converging, all sharing the same sense of loss. They were all heading to the force's base. They were going to converge there for the first step of the send-off. After they returned to the village, the bodies of the deceased remained in the base, with only their families and close friends allowed to view them. The bodies were to stay there until the burial day, which was today. The plan was for the bodies of the deceased to be moved to the clan tombs to be cremated, and their ashes would be stored in the very tombs which were beneath the Naka shrine. This tradition was a way to honor the fallen and keep their memory alive within the Uchiha clan sacred ground. The reason why the Uchiha clan chose to cremate the bodies of their shinobi instead of just burying them was so that no outsider would get a chance to study their bodies as they were still a treasure trove since they offered more than their sharingans. Inside the base, the bodies of the fallen were laid out, each draped in fresh bandages. The sight of them brought a fresh wave of sorrow to the people present. When they arrived at the base, Renjiro felt a sense of relief seeing the crowd already forming. It meant they wouldn't have to wait long for the procession to the tombs. The base was filled with the quiet murmur of conversations and the subdued sounds of people preparing for the solemn event. The rain had finally let up, leaving behind a cool, damp air that matched the mood of the day. After an hour of waiting, the procession began. The families of Tobe, Toda, Suji, and the other two deceased led the way, their expressions a mix of sorrow and dignity. Renjiro scanned their faces and finally met Tobe and Toda's relatives who were holding photos of the two fallen shinobis, so the mother and daughter pair I met the other day talking to Sonoda were their relatives. Their sister is young, I know they said she was around my age but losing most of your family by that age must be tough. The families walked in front of the bodies with a measured pace, guiding the bodies of their loved ones to the clan tombs. 
This tradition signified the families leading their deceased to a peaceful afterlife, a reminder of the bonds that tied them together in life and death. After a couple of minutes, the procession neared the Naka Shrine, I'm surprised we got here quickly. I expected the procession to the clan tombs to take most of the time. It is completely different from what I was used to in my previous life. I guess with the majority of the clan here, they have to consider the time they take. The shrine stood solemnly at the end of their path, with a path below it that headed to the clan tombs where the ashes of the fallen would find their final rest. The entrance to the clan tombs was marked by a large, ancient stone door engraved with the Uchiha symbol. It was a place steeped in history and reverence, where generations of Uchiha shinobi had been laid to rest. When they reached the clan tombs, the procession came to a halt. In front of the ancient stone entrance, a raised wooden platform had been prepared, its polished surface gleaming dully in the muted morning light. The bodies of Tobe, Tota, Suji, and the other two shinobi were carefully placed on the platform. Daichi, the clan head as well as the leader of the force, stepped forward. He stood tall, his presence commanding attention. After the murmur subsided, he began to speak, his voice carrying over the gathered shinobi and their families. Today, we gather to honor the brave souls who gave their lives for the village. Their courage and dedication are a show of the strength and spirit of the Uchiha clan. They fought not just for their own lives, but for the safety and prosperity of Kanoha. Their sacrifice will never be forgotten, and we owe them our deepest gratitude. Renjiro listened to Daichi's speech, but a wave of frustration bubbled him. I thought that Hiruzen was the only one who excelled in peddling propaganda, but I guess I was wrong. From the very start, the mission was issued because the village couldn't let go of Ishigekure and its strategic capabilities. It's not like Kanoha could not survive with it, so, in the end, all this could be avoided. But as they say, shinobi are tools and so am I, hopefully, it won't be for long. Renjiro had heard speeches like this, or in this case, eulogies, many times before, filled with words of valor and sacrifice. To him, it often felt like propaganda, a way to justify the endless cycle of violence that the shinobi world. At this point, he began to understand a certain mercenary group. Daichi's speech finally came to an end, and a murmur of agreement rippled through the crowd. Renjiro took a deep breath, trying to calm the storm of emotions within him. He glanced at Miwa, who stood silently beside him, her eyes fixed on the platform. I guess, this is my cue, Renjiro muttered. Renjiro, along with a few other shinobi, stepped forward. They were to perform the final burial rite, which involved cremating the bodies of the deceased. This group was composed of friends and comrades of the deceased. They had the honor of sending the deceased to the afterlife. The group of 20 shinobi moved with quiet reverence, forming a circle around the raised platform where the bodies of Tobe, Toda, Suji, and the other two shinobi lay. As they took their positions, the twenty shinobi began to perform the required hand signs with slow, deliberate movements. While they could do it faster, their synchronized gestures reflected their shared purpose and the deep respect they held for their fallen comrades. Renjiro focused his chakra, feeling its familiar flow through his body, and channeled it to their hands. As the final hand sign was completed, he joined his voice with the others, uttering the words, Ayan no Tsuyoku no Hano. The incantation resonated through the silent crowd, a solemn prayer for the departed. White flames, pure and radiant, emerged from their hands and seeped into the bodies of the deceased. The jutsu used was the eternal flame of remembrance, a sacred Uchiha clan jutsu. These flames were unlike any fire jutsu he had ever seen. This sacred jutsu was designed specifically for the cremation of Uchiha shinobi, a mark of ultimate respect and reverence. For a long time, Renjiro had been attempting to alter the color of his flames during training and see whether it could bring about a new effect, but he had never achieved anything like this. What made this jutsu even more unique was its reliance on Yin Chakra, in stark contrast to the Yang Chakra typically used in fire jutsus. This shift in chakra nature gave the flames their distinctive color and properties, defying the conventional logic Renjiro had learned about ninjutsu. The jutsu was highly restricted within the clan, and only the twenty shinobi were granted the ability to perform it during the ceremony. This privilege came with a price, a seal was placed on their shoulders, enabling them to use the eternal flame of remembrance. The seal was a complex design, interwoven with symbols and patterns that Renjiro couldn't fully comprehend. 
It was said to be a seal that allowed the user to defy the natural laws of ninjutsu, a concept that both fascinated and unsettled him. Rinjiro's innate paranoia compelled him to seek assurance about the seal's safety. Kushina had assured him that the seal was harmless and solely meant for this sacred purpose, which reassured him. He had no choice but to accept the seal, because he felt that refusing it would mean dishonoring his fallen friends. The seal had a significant limitation, it allowed the shinobi to perform the jutsu only once. This restriction underscored the jutsu's sacredness and the immense responsibility bestowed upon those who wielded it. The flames were not harsh or consuming, instead, they seemed to caress the shrouded forms gently, beginning the cremation process with a respectful, almost tender touch. The gathered crowd watched in respectful silence, each person lost in their own thoughts and prayers. As the cremation progressed, the white flames slowly consumed the shrouded forms, reducing them to ashes. The process was gradual, almost serene, a stark contrast to the violence and chaos that had claimed their lives. When the flames finally subsided, leaving behind only ashes, a profound silence settled over the tomb. The twenty shinobi lowered their hands, the ritual complete. Daichi stepped forward once more, his voice breaking the silence. We honor their sacrifice and cherish their memory. Let us strive to live our lives in a way that would make them proud, carrying their spirit with us in all that we do. The gathered shinobi and clan members nodded in solemn agreement. The families of the deceased stepped forward, collecting the urns that held the ashes of their loved ones. These would be placed in the clan tombs where they would be safeguarded for eternity. As the crowd began to disperse, Renjiro remained for a moment longer, his thoughts lingering on the friends he had lost. He felt a gentle touch on his shoulder and turned to see Miwa standing beside him, ready to go, she asked softly. Renjiro nodded. Yeah. Let's go. Miwa was sitting comfortably in Renjiro's living room, she had a concerned look on her face as she checked up on him. The recent events had taken a toll on Renjiro, and she wanted to ensure her nephew was coping. So, you want to get a summon? Miwa asked, her eyebrows raised in curiosity. Renjiro nodded, setting his cup down on the table. Yeah, I do. Miwa leaned back, studying him. Why? Renjiro took a deep breath before he began explaining. I already faced someone who had a summon, and it made things a lot harder for me. Miwa's brow creased. Who was it? It was Ohashi, Renjiro replied. The Kurigane clan Jown and I fought, during the first time we were in Ishige Kure. Recognition dawned on Miwa's face. Oh, I remember. He was the Jounin who wanted your Sharingan. Renjiro nodded again, yes. He had summoned a huge turtle when we were fighting. The turtle's hard shell enabled Ohashi to defend himself from my attacks. It was a tough fight, and it made me realize how advantageous having a summon could be. Miwa leaned forward, so, that incident made you think about summons and even want one for yourself? Exactly, Renjiro said, I realized that having a summon would not only give me an edge in battle but also provide additional support and strategic options. Miwa took a sip of her tea, considering his words. I see. Summons can be incredibly powerful and versatile. Have you thought about what kind of summon you want? Good question. Renjiro thought. Renjiro shrugged, a small smile playing on his lips. I haven't really decided yet. Maybe something that complements my fighting style and chakra nature. That's a good start, Miwa said thoughtfully. Taking another sip of his tea, Renjiro leaned forward and asked, Miwa, do you have a summon? Miwa shook her head, no, I don't. While summons do provide additional ways of attack and defense, they consume a lot of chakra to summon. A shinobi needs to weigh their pros and cons to see whether what they bring to the table would be worth the chakra lost. Is her chakra that low? Renjiro wondered. Despite knowing Miwa for the majority of his life in Kanoha, he had never gotten the chance to see her in action. All his opinions were based on the fact that he had never bested him in any of their spars when it came to ninjutsu or taijutsu. Whether it was experience or just skill that enabled Miwa to get the better of him, Renjiro did not know. This doesn't mean I don't want a summon. It's just that I haven't come across any animal that would make me want a summon. Summons are powerful, but they're also a big responsibility. You need to find one that truly complements your abilities and fighting style. Miwa added. Renjiro nodded, but if you can't seem to find the right one as you have put it, 
then why don't you just find like three who compliment you differently? After taking a moment to think about it Miwa said, while that may be possible, the more you do so, the more it weighs down on your soul. This could have adverse effects on your growth so you need to find a delicate balance. I guess the fact that Sasuke had more than one summon warped my view on this. But he was Indra's reincarnation, so his case is different. Taking in her words, Renjiro asked the next question on his mind. How do I go about getting a summon? Miwa smiled, there are two main ways of getting a summon. The first way is coming across them naturally. There have been cases where humans or shinobi have stumbled upon habitats or animals that could be made into summons. These encounters can sometimes lead to forming a bond and creating a summoning contract. Renjiro listened intently, intrigued by the possibilities. And the second way, he asked. The second way, Miwa said, is using summoning seals. These seals can transport you into the habitats of various animals. Once you're there, it's up to you to make the summoning contract with them. It's a bit of a gamble, though, as it depends on your luck where you'll appear and which creatures you'll encounter. Luck, my bitter rival. But I don't seem to have any other option. Unless I decided to search for the toads or snakes, which will waste a lot of time. Renjiro considered both options, I think I need a summon sooner rather than later. Given my situation and the challenges I've been facing, using the summoning seals would be ideal. I can't just wait around hoping to stumble upon the right creatures. Miwa nodded in agreement. That makes sense, especially if you're in need of a powerful ally soon. The summoning seals can hasten the process. Renjiro, determined to proceed, asked, what happens next after using the summoning seals? How do I actually go about making the contract once I find a suitable creature? Miwa explained, once you use the summoning seal, you'll be transported to the habitat of the animals linked to that seal. There, you'll need to find and communicate with a potential summoning creature. If you find one that agrees to form a contract with you, you must sign the summoning scroll with your blood. This act binds you to the creature and creates the summoning contract. So, I just need to prove myself worthy and then seal the contract with my blood. It sounds straightforward, but I imagine it's anything but simple. A sudden thought flashed in his mind and Renjiro asked, are there different types of summoning contracts? Yes, Miwa said, there are two types of summoning contracts. The first is the one-way contract. This is where a shinobi imposes their will on an animal, often after using force to tame them. Just like Madara and Abido controlled the Nine Tails. Renjiro mused. What are the advantages of it? Renjiro asked asked. Yes, it requires less chakra to maintain the summoning, and you're assured of the summon's loyalty because they're essentially under your control. It's also easier to annul or dissolve the contract and betray the terms of the agreement if necessary. However, there are significant drawbacks. There's no reverse summoning, meaning the summon can't summon you to their aid or get you out of a dangerous situation. This type of contract also limits the growth of the summon because they are kept in a subservient state, ensuring they don't become stronger than their master and revolt. This is such a strict contract. The fact that it limits the growth of the summon means that it is only affecting against tailed beasts. Renjiro pondered this information, weighing the benefits and drawbacks. And the other type? The second type is the two-way contract. This is where the shinobi and the animal enter into a mutual agreement. In this arrangement, the animal can reverse summon the shinobi to help them, just as the shinobi can summon the animal. This seems better, having the ability to get out of a sticky situation is always helpful. The growth of the summon is not inhibited, in fact, they can grow and develop their abilities freely, which often leads to a stronger and more versatile summon. However, there are cons as well. This type of summoning requires more chakra each time you summon the animal. The contract depends on continuous trust between both parties. If trust is broken, the contract can become unstable. Moreover, it's harder to betray the terms of the agreement or to annul and dissolve the contract, as it is based on mutual respect and trust. The chakra part should not be an issue since I already prepared myself for that when I considered getting a summon. Renjiro mulled over the two types of summoning contracts, weighing their advantages and disadvantages. While the two-way contract seems better in the long run, he began thoughtfully, I don't mind using the one-way summoning contract if I encounter especially hostile animals. It seems more practical in those cases. 
Miwa nodded in agreement. That's a sensible approach. Most people with summons that I know have used the one-way summoning contract. It's easier to initiate, especially when you're stronger than the summon. It guarantees loyalty and immediate control. I didn't even see it from that perspective. What Miwa said forced Renjiro to think deeply about this. What kind of summon did he want? He didn't just want a companion, he wanted an ally, someone who could hold their own in a fight. The idea of having a summon that was vastly weaker than him felt counterproductive. Losing a large amount of chakra for support abilities alone did not seem like a worthy trade-off. If a summon is significantly weaker, it wouldn't make sense to expend so much chakra just for some support abilities, Renjiro said, echoing his thoughts. Miwa leaned back, considering his words. True. The strength and abilities of the summon should complement your own. It all boils down to how you want your summon to complement you. Renjiro nodded, it will all depend on the situation I find myself in once I use the summoning seals. I'll need to assess the animals I encounter and decide then. Miwa then added, there are also two subtypes for both one-way and two-way contracts, person-to-person -person and person-to-community. Renjiro looked curious, prompting Miwa to elaborate. A person-to-person -person contract is when a shinobi forms a contract with a single summon. This has its advantages and disadvantages. The main disadvantage of a person-to-person -person contract is the lack of variety. You are limited to the abilities of that single summon. If you need different skills or support in various situations, you might find this limiting. Miwa paused, letting the information sink in before continuing. On the other hand, a person-to-community contract is where a shinobi forms a contract with an entire species of animals. This has its advantages and disadvantages too. Renjiro's eyes lit up with interest. Miwa went on, the major pro of a person-to-community contract is the variety of skills you can access. You can summon different beings from the same species, each with unique abilities. This offers a lot more flexibility. Just like Naruto and the Toads. Renjiro couldn't help but think. But, Miwa cautioned, the chakra cost varies. Summoning different beings means the amount of chakra you use can differ. Some might require more chakra than others, depending on their size and abilities. Renjiro nodded, absorbing this new information. So, a person-to-community contract provides more options, but at the cost of unpredictable chakra usage. Exactly, Miwa affirmed. It's about weighing the options and deciding what suits your needs best. I really need to decide what exactly I need from my summons. It will make things this whole process easier for me. Miwa, as if reading Renjiro's thought, added, it's important to decide on your primary need for a summon. Do you need one that can help with tracking, mobility, defense, or attacking? Having a clear purpose will guide you when using the summoning seals. It'll make it easier to form the right contract. Renjiro nodded, appreciating Miwa's advice. You're right. If I know what I need most, I'll be better prepared to make a contract that truly benefits me. Renjiro felt grateful for Miwa's guidance. She had provided him with a wealth of knowledge and a clear direction to follow. Thank you, Miwa. Your advice is invaluable. I'll take the time to consider everything you've told me. Miwa nodded, her eyes reflecting encouragement and confidence in him. I have no doubt you'll make the right choice, Renjiro. You're a thoughtful and capable shinobi. Trust your instincts and your training. I just hope that luck treats him better. Getting a summon is a dangerous exercise. Miwa thought. What Miwa failed to tell Renjiro was that some part of her was just afraid of getting a summon. She had heard of how her colleagues and friends had gotten their summons and the fear of the unknown of being thrown in different environments discouraged her from wanting a summon. You first had to survive a different environment before you could even get a chance to challenge the animals you'd want to form a summoning contract with. While she was ashamed of this part of her, Miwa also didn't feel the need to tell Renjiro this because she knew her nephew. He definitely wouldn't pursue this matter without doing his due diligence right? Renjiro, who was not aware of the oversight he just did, turned his thoughts inward, contemplating the qualities he needed in a summon. Considering all the battles that I have heard, the skills that I lack or haven't mastered yet as well as the support required. The ideal summon needs to be very skilled. Whether it was tracking, mobility, defense, or offensive capabilities, he needed a summon that would complement his abilities and fill the gaps in his skill set. 
But the fact that I will have to depend on luck, makes me not want to waste any more time thinking about this. The only deal breaker I have is that the summon must have access to Senjutsu, otherwise any support of offense they provide wouldn't be good enough. While I can also read Ohashi's mind to get an understanding of how the Kurigane clan manipulated nature's chakra, being taught by my summon would be a better medium of learning. With a clearer sense of purpose, Renjiro began to formulate a plan. He would meditate on his needs and prepare himself mentally and physically for the summoning process. With the majority of his plan already in motion, Renjiro scoured both the Uchiha clan library and the Kanoha library for books on summoning seals. The initial plan was straightforward, purchase the summoning seals and use them. However, a conversation with Kushina Uzumaki had shifted his perspective. She told him that creating the seals himself would likely improve his luck. Renjiro was not usually superstitious, but he figured that if there was anything that might give him a better chance, it was worth the effort. If crafting the seals himself could improve his odds of success, he was willing to put in the work. Additionally, he needed something to keep his mind occupied, something to distract him from the recent events. Delving into the complexities of Fuenjutsu seemed like the perfect way to channel his focus and energy. Renjiro spent hours poring over the texts, absorbing every detail he could find about summoning seals. It was a meticulous art, demanding both intellectual and practical skills. Renjiro's determination to master it only grew stronger as he delved deeper into the subject. His search in the Kanoha library was equally fruitful. He found several books detailing the history of summoning contracts, various types of summoning seals, and the theoretical underpinnings of the space-time matrix used in the seals. Renjiro's understanding of the subject broadened, and he began to feel more confident in his ability to create effective summoning seals. Renjiro did not hesitate before putting all he learned into practice. He meticulously drew and redrew the seals, practicing the precise strokes needed to form the complex patterns. The process was painstaking, but Renjiro found solace in the methodical work. Each stroke of the brush, each completed seal, brought him a step closer to his goal. After three days of continuous practice, Renjiro finally finished a bunch of summoning seals. Fourteen seals? I think this is enough. Kushina shuffled through a bunch of seals, her hands deftly sorting and inspecting each one. Despite the lamp on her desk not fully lighting up the room, she had no trouble going over the seals, using chakra to enhance her vision. Renjiro, standing a couple of steps away, observed Kushina's skillful handling of the seals. He was hoping that everything was fine with them so he could finally get a summon. As he waited, his mind wandered off, it is funny that this is a world where people can manifest all the elements and perform incredible feats with chakra, yet the development of this place is way slower than earth because they still use lamps as a source of light. Then again, it's not like shinobi need it because of chakra. So it is kinda understandable that the development of this world is slow because of the versatile dependence and use of chakra. Maybe even it was the civilians who pushed for the technological advancements that happened between now and the start of the anime. After a while, Kushina looked up from the seals, breaking Renjiro's train of thought. So, Renjiro, she asked, how long did it take you to master these seals? Renjiro replied, it was longer than I expected. The overall seal wasn't too hard to master, but the Jutsushiki was a bit challenging. It contained aspects I wasn't familiar with. Kushina looked intrigued. Which aspects gave you trouble, she asked. It had space-time aspects in the Matrix formula, Renjiro explained. Kushina's eyes widened slightly. Just as expected, she thought. Seals involving space-time aspects are rare and notoriously difficult to master, she said. It's impressive that you managed to work through it. Space-time ninjutsu is a complex field, even for experienced shinobi. Renjiro nodded, feeling a mix of pride and relief at her words. It took a lot of trial and error, he admitted. But once I understood the basic principles, the three days of continuous practice were worth it and I could piece together the rest of the matrix. Three days? And he said that it was longer than he expected? Did he expect to master it in a day? Kushina thought. Remember, the key to successfully getting a summoning is not just in the seal but in your connection with the summon. Trust your instincts and be open to what the encounter may bring. Renjiro nodded, absorbing her advice. He felt more prepared and confident than before, so that was progress.
He learned them so fast, even Minato is having issues with figuring out the workings of Lord Second's Jutsu. Should I ask him to ask Renjiro? He might help. No, that would be crazy. Besides him being too young to know about that Jutsu, mastering summoning seals is way easier than an S-rank Jutsu. Kushina's mind veered off. One of her friends, Minato had just been rewarded by an S-rank Jutsu by the Hokage for his contributions to the village. Well, friend was a loose term since Minato was her only friend in Kanoha. Renjiro did not count since Kushina considered him as family due to the clan relations which was valid in its own ways. Minato had been struggling with the Jutsu which was to be expected as it was made by the second Hokage, who was a genius that created numerous Jutsus in Kanoha. So the next person he could ask was Kushina, the very person who taught him most of his few in Jutsu. However, Kushina also encountered the same problems. That was the major reason why Kushina considered asking for Renjiro's help. While he was not yet a few in Jutsu Grandmaster, a different perspective was always welcomed in solving problems. Renjiro looked at Kushinaho was still deep in thought. So the seals are fine, he asked, wanting to ensure he could use them as soon as possible. Kushina nodded, yes, they are. You've done well to be cautious and create extra seals. Having 14 seals means you have enough for 7 trips. This gives you a much better chance of finding the summon you want. Renjiro chuckled inwardly. She thinks I made more seals out of caution, but honestly, I was just being paranoid, he knew all too well that a lot of things could go wrong during the summoning process. Realizing he was spiraling into negative thoughts that could jinx his chances, he quickly decided to shut down those thoughts. With that, Renjiro left Kushina's home, feeling a mix of excitement and nervousness. As he walked through the village, the cool morning air filled his lungs, and he felt a sense of purpose. Once back in his room, Renjiro spread out the 14 summoning seals he had created. Each seal was a work of art, intricately designed with symbols and patterns that reflected his understanding of the Fuenjutsu of summoning seals. I hope this is enough, Renjiro thought. He picked up one of the seals and examined it closely. The symbol seemed to shimmer slightly, an indication of the chakra infused within the very ink used. Stealing his resolve, Renjiro placed the seal back with the others. I need to pack all the essentials in my storage seals, I am not even sure how long this would take. I just hope I complete this before anyone comes looking for me. Renjiro stood in his room, having packed everything he thought he might need for this summoning process. After double-checking that all the summoning seals were securely stowed, he took a deep breath, expelling it loudly as if to rid himself of any lingering doubts. This is it, he thought, feeling a surge of determination. He carefully picked up one of the summoning seals and held it in his right hand. With his left hand, he formed the necessary hand sign, his fingers moving with practiced precision. As he channeled his chakra into the seal, he felt a tingling sensation travel down his arm and into the paper, the symbols and patterns glowing faintly in response. Here goes nothing, Renjiro muttered to himself, focusing intently on the seal. The seal responded almost immediately. There was a brief, intense moment where Renjiro felt as if he was being pulled in multiple directions at once. Poof! Renjiro's surroundings began to blur, and a cloud of smoke enveloped him. The smoke was thick and swirling, obscuring everything from view. When the smoke cleared, Renjiro found himself disoriented, his vision spinning. He took a moment to steady himself, blinking rapidly to clear his head. As his senses began to sharpen, he realized with a jolt that he was not standing on solid ground. He was free-falling through the air, the sensation of weightlessness causing his heart to race. Panic set in for a brief moment as Renjiro scanned his surroundings, trying to make sense of where he was. All he could see below him was a vast expanse of water, stretching out endlessly in every direction. The sunlight reflected off the surface, creating a blinding glare that made it difficult to gauge how far he was from the water. Great! Of all the places I could end up, I just had to appear close to the ocean. Renjiro thought as he prepared himself for his imminent fall into the waters. I need to think first quickly, Renjiro gathered his thoughts. He needed to soften his landing or, at the very least, ensure he wouldn't hit the water at a dangerous speed. With a focused burst of chakra, he cast a wind blast jutsu to slow his descent. His body gradually decelerated, and he angled himself to make a smoother entry into the water. 
I'll just have to swim up, landing on my feet at this angle would be difficult. Renjiro lamented. As he hit the surface, the impact was much gentler than it could have been. Renjiro plunged into the cool water, feeling it envelop him. He kicked his legs and swam upwards, breaking through to the surface with a gasp. He immediately made a shadow clone who appeared above him. The shadow clone did not waste time and pulled Renjiro out of the water before it disappeared, leaving Renjiro standing on the water. I thought I'd never have the need for this after completing my chakra control exercises but look at me, Renjiro chuckled. Treading water, he looked around, trying to get his bearings. The water was clear and blue, with no immediate sign of land. Am I in the middle of an ocean, he wondered, his Sharingan activated to pierce through his surroundings. But then, out of the corner of his eye, Renjiro noticed a shadow moving beneath the water. It was large and swift, cutting through the depths with ease. Renjiro steadied his breathing, preparing himself for whatever might come. It seems like this is the animal that attracted the seal. Despite mastering the seal, Renjiro had long given up understanding how the seal worked. Apparently, it would send him near an animal that he could turn into a summon. How that was decided, Renjiro didn't know and just concluded it as one of the mysteries only possible by using chakra. Suddenly, the water's surface broke with a powerful surge. A massive black and white form leapt from the depths, sending a spray of water cascading around. It was an orca, its sleek body glistening in the sunlight. The killer whale's intelligent eyes locked onto Renjiro, and in that moment, he understood the challenge before him. While fighting on water is not impossible, it is still going to be hard. My name is Uzumaki Renjiro and I am a shinobi from Kanahagakur, I request to make a summoning contract with you, Renjiro shouted. However, the orca circled him, creating waves that threatened to destabilize Renjiro's footing. It was either it did not hear him or it just did not care enough to respond to Renjiro. Renjiro struggled to maintain his balance on the shifting water, his chakra control tested to its limits. This was his first battle on such a terrain, and the unfamiliarity was evident in his uneasy stance. All right, so that's how it is, Renjiro said. He formed a series of hand signs, summoning a wind jutsu. While Renjiro could not use his fire jutsu for obvious reasons, wind chakra nature was equally destructive if used well. The only issue was that he was not trying to kill the whale, instead, he wanted to beat some sense into it. Renjiro unleashed a powerful gust of wind towards the orca, hoping to push it back or at least slow it down. The orca, however, dived beneath the water with remarkable agility, evading the attack entirely. Unfair advantage. Renjiro cursed under his breath, realizing that fighting an aquatic creature in its own domain was far more challenging than he had expected. The orca reappeared behind him, slamming its tail fin into the water and sending a shockwave through the sea. The force of the impact disrupted Renjiro's concentration, and he nearly lost his footing. Desperate to gain some control over the battle, Renjiro launched Kunai infused with explosive tags into the water. The detonations created a series of underwater blasts, but the orca maneuvers expertly around them, using the explosions to mask its movements. It surged forward, jaws open, and Renjiro barely managed to leap aside, avoiding the massive teeth by a hair's breadth. Am I that delicious looking that it would rather eat me than just listen to me? Panting, Renjiro realized he needed to adapt quickly. His typical strategies were of limited use here. He used his Sharingans to focus on the orca's movements. As the creature lunged again, Renjiro anticipated its path and countered with a precise wind wave jutsu. He unleashed the powerful wind wave, hoping to slice through the water and hit the orca. The orca countered with its own water wave, the water wave surged forward, meeting Renjiro's wind attack head-on. The resulting clash created a massive spray, obscuring Renjiro's vision for a moment. So it can use water jutsu, well that is not surprising at all considering where we are. When the water settled, the orca was already on the move again, circling Renjiro with relentless speed. Renjiro formed another series of hand signs. He created a wind tornado on the water, hoping to trap the orca within its vortex. The swirling winds whipped the sea into a frenzy, and for a moment, it seemed like the orca was caught. But the creature countered with its own technique. A massive water vortex formed, clashing with Renjiro's tornado. Is he copying the jutsus that I am using? Well, that's just rude. It doesn't even have a Sharingan. 
The two forces struggled for dominance, water and wind battling in a chaotic dance. Rinjiro strained to maintain the jutsu, but the orca's mastery of water chakra nature was evident. The aquatic tornado grew stronger, pushing back against Renjiro's wind with overwhelming force. Water splashed around him, soaking him and disrupting his chakra control. While it is powerful, I can't keep this on for long. I can keep wasting my chakra on something that isn't even listening to me. Renjiro retrieved another seal and with a swift hand sign, he activated it. Similar to the first time, a cloud of smoke enveloped him transporting him away, pulling him from the watery battleground and depositing him safely back at his home. Rinjiro collapsed onto solid ground, drenched and a bit exhausted but alive. Why was it so hostile? It doesn't matter, I wasn't even a fan of water from the start. After taking a moment, Rinjiro decided to go again after popping a ration pill. He couldn't wait to regain all his chakra, but he also needed to be in his best shape if he were to encounter another hostile animal. When Renjiro used the seal he was brought to a vibrant rainforest. The air was thick with humidity, and the sound of various exotic wildlife filled his ears. As Renjiro took in his new surroundings, the rustle of leaves and a low growl caught his attention. He swiftly turned, activating his Sharingan. Emerging from the underbrush were horned jaguars, their sleek, muscular forms adorned with formidable horns jutting from their heads. Cautiously, Renjiro flickered away to perch silently on a high branch, observing the creatures from above. I need to first observe before engaging. The horned jaguars appeared to be engaged in some sort of play, bounding and leaping through the forest with extraordinary agility. Renjiro's eyes widened as he noticed them performing wind jutsus effortlessly, manipulating gusts of wind to propel themselves and create playful whirlwinds. For a moment, hope surged within Renjiro. These creatures had a natural affinity for wind jutsus, just like him. If he could communicate and form a pact with them, they would make good summons. However, as time passed, Renjiro's excitement waned. Despite their impressive display of wind jutsus, the horned jaguars showed no signs of sentience. They communicated only through roars, grunts, and occasional meows, their interactions driven purely by instinct rather than any form of higher intelligence. They lacked the sentient awareness necessary to form a summoning pact. Sigh. They would have made good summons. With no other options left, Renjiro activated another summoning seal. In an instant, he was transported back home. With ten more seals to go, Renjiro used another one. When the smoke dissipated, he found himself standing in a dingy, dark cave. The air was damp and cold, carrying a musty scent that spoke of age and neglect. A dark cave? Am I finally going to get a snake? Renjiro was excited at the thought but he stayed still allowing his eyes to adjust to the oppressive darkness. Slowly, the shadows began to take shape around him, revealing the jagged stalactites hanging from the ceiling and the uneven, rocky floor beneath his feet. A faint skittering sound echoed through the cavern, growing louder and more distinct. As his vision cleared, Renjiro's heart skipped a beat. All around him, were spiders. These spiders dwarfed even the ones he had encountered in the forest of death. A particularly large spider, its eyes gleaming with an unsettling intelligence, skittered closer, its mandibles clicking ominously. We have a guest. The spider released its high-pitched voice. No. Just no. Without a second thought, Renjiro pulled out another summoning seal. The familiar rush of chakra surged through him, and he felt the pull of the jutsu yanking him away from the nightmare around him. I thought making the seals would give me better luck, so why did I appear in front of spiders? That was just a waste of two seals. He lamented once he was back in his home. His arachnophobia did not make him entertain the idea of having a spider, or a cluster, of them as summons. Renjiro was determined to get a summon as soon as possible and in his next try, he found himself standing amidst a range of rolling hills. The sky above was a clear expanse of blue, and a gentle breeze rustled the sparse vegetation. There was no immediate sign of life, no movement in the distance. Curiosity peaked, he decided to scale one of the hills to get a better view of the area. Just as he reached the crest of the hill, the ground began to tremble. Rumble, rumble. The entire range started to shake violently, the vibrations resonating through the earth and up through Renjiro's legs. What's happening, he muttered, his balance wavering. The shaking intensified, and Renjiro stumbled, 
losing his footing and tumbling down the slope. He hit the ground hard, rolling to a stop at the base of the hill. Groaning, he pushed himself up, his head spinning. As he regained his senses, a massive shadow loomed over him. Blinking to clear his vision, Renjiro found himself staring directly into a gigantic eye. The eye, as large as a boulder, blinked slowly, staring at him. What the hell? Renjiro whispered, awe and apprehension mingling in his voice. He scrambled to his feet, stepping back to get a better view. The eye belonged to an enormous creature partially buried in the hills, its form blending seamlessly with the landscape. The hills themselves seemed to be a part of its massive, undulating body. The creature shifted, and the ground beneath Renjiro's feet trembled once more. Rumble, rumble. With a low, resonant groan, the creature raised its head, revealing more of its colossal form. I am not seeing my own things, right? Renjiro remarked as he took in the humongous form of the beast or thing in front of him. It was a gigantic tortoise, its shell covered in moss and rocky protrusions that made it look like part of the terrain. Its eyes, now fully visible, exuded a calm yet ancient wisdom. This is big, it is basically a living mountain. Renjiro's mind raced. This creature was unlike any he had encountered before, a living mountain with a presence that radiated power. He sensed no immediate hostility, but the sheer size and potential strength of the tortoise were intimidating. Gathering his composure, Renjiro took a cautious step forward, his demeanor tensed, ready to react if needed. Hello, he called out, his voice steady but respectful. I am Uzumaki Renjiro. May I get the privilege of knowing who I am before? The tortoise's massive eye focused on Renjiro, and for a moment, there was only silence. Then, with a deep, rumbling voice that seemed to echo through the hills, the tortoise spoke. An Uzumaki? It's been long since one of them came to my domain. And he wants to make a summoning contract? The mountain turtle wondered. I am Kamigami, the last of the Ugoka clan, it said, each word resonating with the weight of centuries. Why do you seek a summon, young shinobi? Rinjiro bowed slightly, acknowledging the creature's immense presence. I seek strength and wisdom to protect my village and those I care about. I have faced many trials in my path and I am sure I will face many more in the future, so I believe that with a strong summon, I can achieve my goals. Rinjiro just said what was in his heart. He did not dare lie as with such an imposing creature, he wouldn't be surprised if he had an ability to detect lies. So he had to be careful to make sure that his first impression lasted. Kamigami regarded him thoughtfully. Strength and wisdom are not easily granted, the tortoise said slowly. They must be earned and proven. Are you sure you or you have what it takes? Whatever it takes. Are there some kind of trials that I have to go through? Renjiro wondered but in the end, he decided to go with the flow. He nodded and said, I am ready, he declared. I will face whatever challenges are necessary. Kamigami's eyes studied Renjiro intently. Come closer, young shinobi, the tortoise rumbled, its voice deep and resonant. Let us see if you are worthy. Renjiro took a deep breath, steadying himself. He nodded and stepped forward. Stand still, Kamigami instructed, lifting one of its colossal claws. The claw, the size of a full-grown human adult, cast a vast shadow over Renjiro. Is the test him placing the claw on me? Kamigami's claw descended slowly, and as it made contact with Renjiro's head, a strange sensation washed over him. His body temperature began to rise rapidly, beads of sweat forming on his brow and trickling down his face. Arf! What is this? Renjiro wondered, gritting his teeth against the growing discomfort. The heat was intense, unlike anything he had experienced before, but it wasn't coming from the tortoise's touch. It felt as if it was welling up from deep within him. Kamigami's claw remained in place, while time seemed to stretch, each second feeling like an eternity. Rinjiro's mind raced, trying to understand what was happening. It's not like I am being affected by the pressure he is exuding, so what is it? Or is his claw inserting something in me? Sweat dripped from Renjiro's face, his breathing becoming labored. Yet, he stood his ground, refusing to falter. He closed his eyes, focusing on his determination. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Kamigami withdrew its claw. The pressure lifted, and Renjiro's body temperature began to normalize. He gasped for breath, falling to his knees. Finally. I thought that I was going to burn to death. Hopefully, I passed this test. Renjiro braced himself for Kamigami's verdict, 
expecting words of either approval or rejection. However, the ancient tortoise remained silent. The silence was profound and loud, the only sound being the distant rustle of wine through the hills. Huh? Why is he silent? He glanced up at Kamigami, hoping to glean some insight from the tortoise's expressionless visage, but the creature's face remained an unreadable mask of stone. Minutes passed, each second stretching out painfully. Unable to bear the silence any longer, Renjiro took a tentative step forward. Kamigami, he began, did I pass your test? The tortoise remained still for a moment, the only movement being the slow blink of its massive eyes. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Kamigami spoke, his voice deep and resonant. No. The single word hit Renjiro like a blow. Why not, he asked, struggling to keep his voice steady. What did I do wrong? While you were forthcoming with your desire and determination, there is a sinister presence within you, the tortoise said slowly. This presence prevents me from entering into a summoning contract with you. A sinister presence? What the hell is he talking about? What is this presence? Renjiro asked Kamigami shook his massive head, the movement causing the ground to tremble slightly. It is not my place to say, he replied. Such matters are beyond my domain. You must seek out the truth for yourself. How do you just drop the bomb and just leave me like that? Is there anything I can do to remove this presence? Renjiro, I have already said that it is beyond my control. The only thing you should do is leave. Why has his mood changed all of a sudden? He was friendly before whatever he did to me. I should be the one who is angry because I don't know what he did to me, what if he inserted something dangerous in me? Bummed out and filled with a mixture of confusion and frustration, Renjiro bowed respectfully to Kamigami. Thank you for your time and your wisdom, he said, his voice subdued. He retrieved his summoning seal and activated it. Instantly, Renjiro was transported back to the familiar surroundings of his home. Is my luck that bad? First, the whale tried to kill me, then I met the spiders and now Kamigani basically chased me away. There must be something I am doing wrong. With only six seals left, Renjiro decided to just forget what happened and keep on trying. The next summoning took him to a volcanic region. The air was thick with the scent of sulfur, and the ground beneath his feet was hot, cracked, and unstable. Rivers of molten lava flowed nearby, the intense heat making the air shimmer. As Renjiro cautiously navigated the treacherous place, he was astonished to see sharks, yes, sharks, swimming through the lava as if it were water. But as he tried to approach, hoping to communicate, it became clear that these lava sharks, like the horned jaguars before, lacked the sentience required for forming a summoning contract. Disappointed, Renjiro activated another seal, this time, he was transported to a vast desert. The sun beat down mercilessly, and waves of heat distorted the horizon. Soon, he noticed large lizards burrowing in and out of the sand, their scales glistening in the harsh sunlight. Intrigued, Renjiro observed their behavior, hoping to find some sign of intelligence or communication. However, just like the creatures in the volcanic region, these lizards were driven by primal instincts. Maybe the beast Kamigami was talking about was my terrible luck. Because why do I keep running into animals with minimal sentience? Frustration began to mount within Renjiro. He had traveled to extraordinary places and encountered incredible creatures, yet none of them possessed the sentience or willingness needed for a summoning contract. There's no need wasting time here. I have one more trip left. It's better I get done with this sooner rather than later. After activating the seal, Renjiro found himself standing in what looked like a giant nest. The nest was enormous, almost the size of his house, made of intricately woven branches and twigs. So I am in a nest this time. He got up slowly, brushing off bits of debris, and began to walk around the empty nest, studying its structure. The nest's height was staggering, perched high above the clouds. Thunder and lightning rumbled and flashed in the distance, illuminating the floating islands that hovered around the nest. Floatan Islands, it kinda reminds me of what I imagine Kumo to be. But what animal am I going to meet this time? As he pondered what kind of animal could create such a structure, a fierce gust of wind suddenly assaulted him. Renjiro looked up, shielding his eyes, and saw the source, a huge grey bird flapping its mighty wings. The winds whipped around Renjiro, nearly knocking him off balance. The bird, an eagle standing at over 30 feet tall, landed gracefully in the nest. 
Its feathers were a striking blend of gray and white, with white tips that gleamed in the stormy light. Its beak and talons were a radiant gold, adding an aura of regality to its already imposing presence. Renjiro stood still, studying the magnificent creature before him, when a voice interrupted his thoughts. Who are you? the bird asked, its voice deep and resonant. Who are you? Startled, Renjiro looked into the eagle's piercing gray eyes. Finally another sentient one. Let's hope this does not end up like the one with Kamigami. I am Uzumaki Renjiro, he replied, his voice steady but respectful. I am a shinobi from Kanahagawa and I am here seeking a summon. The eagle's eyes narrowed slightly as if evaluating Renjiro's words and intent. And why do you seek a summon, Uzumaki Renjiro, the bird inquired, its gaze never wavering. This again. Renjiro took a deep breath, choosing his words carefully. I wish to protect my village and those I care about. I know that with a strong and wise summon, I can become even stronger than I am. The eagle considered his response for a moment, the silence filled with the distant rumble of thunder. You speak with conviction, the bird said finally. But many have sought my power, and few have proven themselves worthy. What makes you different, Renjiro? Renjiro met the eagle's gaze, I won't stand here and say how I faced countless adversities and have never given up, even when the odds were against me or how my resolve is unbreakable, and I am willing to prove my worth through any trial you deem necessary. I just want to survive, plain and simple. I have a goal that I am working towards and I will do whatever it takes to get there. Getting a summon would of course make the whole process easier. If not, then I also understand. Rinjiro shrugged at the last statement. If he were to be honest he was just tired of the process at that point. The unexplained rejection he got from Kamejima did not improve his situation. It was not like he was giving up or anything, he just became numb to the whole situation. So he decided to speak his mind without giving much thought to the consequences, whether they would be positive or negative. Well, at least he is, honest. The eagle thought as he nodded slowly, its expression thoughtful. Very well, Renjiro. I am Tenjin, the guardian of this nest. To earn my pact and that of my clan, you must prove your worth not just in strength, but in spirit and wisdom. Are you prepared to face the trials I will set before you? There's more of them? Yes, I am prepared. Renjiro nodded. Then get on top of me, the eagle commanded. Renjiro was taken aback by the sudden request. Why? Do you expect to partake in your trials here? Tenjin replied. He's right. All right, Renjiro said, climbing onto Tenjin's broad back. The feathers were surprisingly soft yet strong, providing a stable grip. The moment Renjiro was secure, Tenjin took off, his powerful wings slicing through the air. The speed was not overwhelming but just fast enough to let Renjiro take in the breathtaking scenery around them. As they soared higher, Renjiro marveled at the numerous floating islands dotting the sky. Each island, similar to the one he had appeared on, had an empty nest perched atop it. Why are these nests empty? At first, I thought that I was directly transported to a bird's nest but now seeing what the other islands have, I think it's something different. The landscape below shifted as they flew, the floating islands gradually giving way to a new sight. In the distance, a towering mountain came into view, its peak shrouded in mist and clouds. Renjiro couldn't tell if the mountain was floating like the islands or rooted to the earth, as its base was obscured by the dense cloud cover. As they neared the mountain, Tenjin's speed increased. The eagle inclined its body, heading straight for the summit. Renjiro felt the air grow thinner and colder. Even the ticklish feeling Renjiro had been experiencing since they began their journey turned into a mild prickling sensation. Hmm, what is this odd feeling? At first, Renjiro wondered if the thinness of the air was getting to him, but he quickly dismissed that thought. With his ability to manipulate chakra, such things shouldn't affect him. The mild prickling sensation soon intensified, becoming increasingly painful as Tenjin ascended higher. Despite the growing discomfort, Renjiro maintained his resolve. Is it the air that is affecting me? Any pain is nothing new to me, at this rate even what Kamigami did to me was worse. As they continued to fly for over an hour, the altitude and the pain both steadily increased making Renjiro regret comparing his encounter with the mountain being to now. Eventually, they reached a large crater on the side of the mountain. As Tenjin descended into the crater, Renjiro's condition had deteriorated significantly. 
Blood trickled from his nose, ears, and even his eyes, the pain now a relentless, searing force. Still, he held on to the eagle's wings, refusing to let go. As they landed, Renjiro was so focused on his own struggle that he didn't immediately notice the other eagles gathered in the crater. These majestic birds, similar in size and stature to Tenjin, with some even larger, watched the newcomer with keen interest. Among them, an eagle smaller than the rest, distinguished by a striking silver beak, approached Tenjin. Is this the guest? The smaller eagle asked, her voice sharp and clear. Tenjin inclined his head respectfully. Yes, Lady Momo. He is the guest you sensed entering our domain. He claims to be here seeking a summon. Lady Momo regarded Renjiro with a mixture of curiosity and scrutiny. It has been a long time since we have had a guest, let alone a shinobi who desires to make us his summon. It is good that he has survived his trip all the way up here. Very few manage to do so, so it speaks of his potential. Lady Momo thought. Renjiro, instinctively sensing the intense focus of the eagles, snapped out of his reverie. His innate healing had helped him stay functional, but even they had their limits. What happened? Renjiro thought as he immediately circulated neutral chakra throughout his body, aiming to heal the damage that his natural healing had not yet addressed. Seeing that Renjiro was now back on his feet, Lady Momo approached him. It has been long since our clan welcomed a guest, she said, the last time we had one, I was still a young eaglet. Young? From her size, I first thought that she's the youngest eagle here, but from how the rest are behaving, she is either a respected entity or even their leader. Bowing respectfully, Renjiro repeated his purpose. I am Uzumaki Renjiro, here seeking a summon. Momo nodded. I believe, Tenjin has informed you of the trials you must face, correct? Renjiro nodded in response. Yes, Lady Momo. When do I begin? Momo's beak curved slightly in what could be interpreted as a smile. You have already begun, she said her tone carrying a hint of mischief. Renjiro's eyes widened in surprise. Already? Yes, Momo confirmed. Your journey through the crater was the first of your trials. I am sure you have already noticed that there was something wrong with the chakra surrounding this place. I guess that explains why I experienced that sudden and inexplicable pain. But at least I survived, although I have my healing to thank for that. Seeing the shinobi still in thought Momo decided to add, with our domain the sky, we have access to the purest natural energy. Renjiro's eyes widened immediately when he heard what Momo told him. Excuse me, did you say natural energy? Renjiro could not help but ask. Momo nodded her head slightly, yes, that is an advantage of living so high in the sky, the chakra is denser and purer until you reach this mountain where you can have access to natural energy. So they do have access to natural energy. Renjiro conclude. Senjutsu was something that he had always wanted to learn. However, there were limited avenues of learning it as only a selected few had access to that knowledge. His only best shot was to get a summon who had access to it and it seemed like that was the case. The only issue was to determine whether he would be able to learn it or not. Let me first focus on getting their trust through the trials, I haven't even made a summoning contract with them. Then, what is the next trial? Renjiro asked, his voice steady but filled with curiosity. Lady Momo's gaze remained steady on Renjiro as she continued, your next and final trial will be combat. Good. It is hard to complicate that. And it is also the last trial. I'm glad to hear that this will be my last trial, he said, who will I be facing? Momo's eyes gleamed with a mix of pride and seriousness. You will face my young eaglet, Uno. She is destined to be the next head of our clan. As she spoke, the sound of powerful wings beating the air, grew louder. Womp! Womp! Another eagle, slightly larger and with the same distinctive silver beak as Momo, descended and landed gracefully beside them. Renjiro felt the rush of wind from the massive wings, causing him to brace himself against the force. I suppose this is Uno. But if she is still an eaglet and she is this big, then what will happen when she fully matures? Renjiro thought. The sheer size and presence of Uno were intimidating. She was larger than the other eagles except for Tenjin, her plumage a stunning mix of silver and grey. Uno's eyes, sharp and intelligent, locked onto Renjiro. So, this is the thing who seeks to form a relationship with us, she said. 
She wasn't being rude it was just that she had never come across any other being who wasn't an eagle all her life since her clan was secluded from the rest of the world. Renjiro nodded, ignoring the eagle's demeaning remarks. Yes, I am Uzumaki Renjiro. Uno spread her wings, the sound of her feathers rustling filling the air. Swish. Then prove it, she challenged. Show me that you are worthy of our clan's trust. I am not at my best, but I think I can take her. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. Rinjiro took a deep breath, centering himself. His body was still recovering, but he had faced and overcome worse. Momo stepped back, giving them space. The trial begins now, she declared. The other eagles, including Tenjin and Momo, moved back, giving the battlefield a wide berth. The eagles took to the skies, flying a significant distance away, creating a spacious arena for them to fight in. Uno wasted no time. She unleashed a high-pitched screech, scree. The sound wave hit Renjiro like a physical force, causing him to clutch his ears in pain. He was already weakened from previously, so he found himself momentarily disoriented despite his efforts to counter it. Taking advantage of his disorientation, Uno summoned a lightning bolt, crackle. Boom! The bolt split the air, heading straight for Renjiro. Despite his compromised state, Renjiro's instinct screamed at him to move. He attempted to flicker away to evade the incoming strike. However, to his shock and horror, he found himself rooted to the spot, his chakra seemingly unresponsive. What's happening, he thought frantically. Why can't I move? I can't access my chakra, what the hell is going on? Rinjiro's mind raced with confusion. The body flicker technique was a jutsu he could perform in his sleep, yet now, in this critical moment, it had failed him. His thoughts spiraled as he tried to understand why. Was I poisoned? Did the eagles use some sort of seal on me? Renjiro tried all of his basic ninjutsu, but the result was still the same. The only way he could use his chakra was through his eyes and that was also accompanied by some pain. With the bolt approaching, Renjiro decided to rely on his raw speed to avoid the incoming lightning bolt. However, even with his Sharingan, he was too slow. The lightning struck him with a searing flash, sending pain coursing through his body. He staggered, the shock temporarily paralyzing his movements. At the edge of the grounds where Renjiro and Uno were fighting, Tenjin, one of the most perceptive eagles, turned to Lady Momo and gave her a knowing glance. He had realized what was happening with Renjiro. Seeing Lady Momo ignoring him, Tenjin asked, Is this your doing? Momo turned to him, her expression calm. No, it is his body's reaction. He was exposed to natural energy. While he survived, he was still in a bad condition. Despite him healing himself, it seems he did not get rid of the aftereffect of losing control and access to his chakra, but do not worry, it is only temporary. Tenjin frowned, you knew all this and still let him fight Uno? Momo nodded, yes. Tenjin's concern deepened. Why? Do you want our first visitor after a long time to die? Momo tried to assure her subordinate, who was also her mate. Tenjin, don't worry. It will not come to that. Not being able to use my ninjutsu is no small inconvenience. It is a massive handicap. Renjiro thought. Uno watched him closely, her sharp eyes missing nothing. She could see his struggle, but she did not relent. Instead, with a powerful thrust of her wings, she launched herself at Renjiro, her talons outstretched and aimed with precision. Fortunately, Renjiro was tracking her movements with his Sharingan. He could see the patterns, the slight shifts in her wings indicating her next move. So he had already begun moving, intending to dodge the attack when Uno moved. Unfortunately, Uno was agile and adapted quickly, using her wings to stabilize herself and dive again with even more force. The only thing I can do is dodge, it is like fighting with my arms tied behind my back. Renjiro barely had time to react. He jumped back and landed on a rocky outcrop. Without the body flicker technique, he was slower and had to depend on his stamina to move around. While it quickly reduced, his regeneration managed to form a balance between his expenditure and regeneration. I need to use my physical skills and tactical thinking. Renjiro narrowed his eyes, focusing on Uno's movements. He had always been a quick learner, and now was the time to put that to the test. With him being intentional, a thought flashed across Renjiro's mind, causing a smirk to spread across his face. I could use that instead, Renjiro realized, a plan forming in his mind. 
Meanwhile, Uno was growing increasingly frustrated. She had been promised a challenging fight against this tiny thing her mother called human, who had intruded into her home, but so far, he had done nothing but dodge her attacks. Why can't he stay put? She had managed to hit him once with one of her jutsus, but since then, he had been evading her strikes with an almost infuriating consistency. Her patience was wearing thin, and her irritation was palpable. Why won't you fight me properly, she screeched, her voice echoing across the mountain range. But Renjiro gave no response, continuing to dodge her attacks with a focused determination. Then, without warning, Renjiro stopped. He stood still, a calm smile playing on his lips. Uno narrowed her eyes, sensing something off. She began to prepare for another attack, but just as she did, she felt a strange sensation in her body, followed by a large explosion. Boom! With no access to his ninjutsu, Renjiro found himself with limited options for combat. His usual avenues of genjutsu and taijutsu were not as effective against a giant eagle like Uno. He was certain Uno would not let him get close enough to use his taijutsu, and while he could still use his genjutsu through the Sharingan, the amount of chakra required to entrap such a massive target would be tremendous. This only left Fuenjutsu as his last resort. With a plan already in place, Renjiro only had to implement it. Out of the stockpile of seals he always carried, only two types would be effective in this situation which were, explosive seals and chakra drain seals. Though they seemed simplistic, these seals were modified with a resonator component. This addition packed more power at the expense of control. His chakra drain seals were more potent than those Kushina had accidentally used on him, capable of holding down a Jounin. From what I have seen, she is more powerful than any Jounin from Kanoha so I'll have to use all the chakra drain seals I have on me. Fortunately, Renjiro didn't just have one seal, he had hundreds of both types. He had been saving them for a rainy day, and with this being his last trip to find a summoning, Renjiro decided to go all out and use them all. The only issue is how do I activate them since I need chakra to do that. Renjiro's mind raced as he dodged another lightning bolt from Uno. Despite his connection to his chakra reserves being disrupted, Renjiro remembered an alternative way to access chakra, his blood. During his Fuenjutsu classes with Kushina, she mentioned that the Uzumaki clan could use their blood as a substitute for chakra ink due to their strong life force. Although Kushina had promised to teach him this technique, Renjiro had already started experimenting, especially after discovering his improved healing abilities during the Magatama process. He concluded that his blood might contain traces of chakra. While Renjiro had never succeeded with this before, he still decided to take the risk. What do I have to lose, he thought. Only this battle and the chance to get an eagle as a summon. I can still make more summoning seals and look for another animal to turn into a summon. With a plan in mind, Renjiro began to implement it. While dodging Uno's attacks, he strategically planted explosive tags around the battlefield. His movements, though appearing random, were meticulously calculated. After placing the explosive tags, Renjiro slowed down, using the opportunity to discreetly place chakra drain seals on Uno's feathers. With his Sharingan, this was easier than he expected. He needed to be precise and undetectable, and the Sharingan allowed him to see and predict Uno's movements with clarity. While she is powerful, it is clear that she doesn't know how to effectively wield her power. Renjiro commented on Uno's fighting style. As Uno launched another lightning attack, Renjiro dodged. He reached into his pouch, pulling out a small kunai and slicing his palm open. Blood welled up, and he quickly sprinkled it on the seals he had prepared. Uno, growing more frustrated, unleashed a high-pitched screech that disoriented Renjiro momentarily. He gritted his teeth against the sound, focusing on his task. He couldn't afford to lose focus now. At the edge of the battlefield, Tenjin watched Renjiro closely. Are you sure about this? He asked Momo. Momo nodded her head. Yes, if the boy cannot survive this, then we are better off alone than having him as our summoner. Back on the battlefield, Renjiro was sprinkling his blood on the seals he had strategically placed around the area. It works. As he did so, he noticed that his theory was spot on, what's more, he could even control the chakra in his blood to activate the seals. This was a huge revelation, making him essentially a living trigger for his modified seals. However, 
He realized that this control was only limited to activating seals and nothing more. I can control the chakra in my chakra, but I can't do the same with my reserves. Something must be wrong with my body. And I am sure the Eagle Momo knows why. He darted around the battlefield, dodging Uno's relentless attacks while sprinkling his blood on all the seals he had planted, including the one on Uno herself. Uno, growing more frustrated, launched a barrage of lightning bolts. Renjiro, his stamina waning, narrowly avoided the attacks, his reflexes sharp despite his condition. He needed to finish this soon. Renjiro finally finished setting his trap. He stood still, with a smirk on his face. Boom! An explosion? But when? He has just been dodging my attacks. Uno tried to counter the explosion with one of her jutsus, but to her shock, she realized she could barely summon her chakra. Panic set in for a brief moment, but she hastily flapped her massive wings, creating powerful gusts of wind to counter the explosion. Renjiro's smirk widened as he watched her struggle. As expected, he muttered. He had predicted that Uno would still have a chance against the explosion even with her chakra being drained. After witnessing what it was he decided to activate the remaining seals he had placed around the battlefield. The seals erupted in a series of controlled explosions, and the chakra-drained seals sapped Uno's remaining strength. Boom! The air filled with the sounds of more explosions and Uno's strained screeches as the blasts overwhelmed her defenses, further weakening her. Uno tried to muster another attack, but the chakra-drained seals were too powerful. They sapped her strength rapidly, leaving her vulnerable. She struggled to stay upright, her massive form swaying as the series of explosions continued to assault her. Tenjin, who had been watching from the sidelines, could no longer stand by. Ignoring Momo's potential wrath, he made a split-second decision. I need to save her. In a flash, Tenjin appeared in front of Uno, his powerful wings spread wide. With a mighty flap, he generated a gust of wind strong enough to deflect some of the explosions, protecting Uno from the brunt of the attack. His presence was a protective barrier, a desperate attempt to shield his daughter from further harm. Momo, watched the scene unfold with a stern expression. It was a grave misconduct, almost treasonous, for Tenjin to act without her command. As the matriarch, she had ultimate authority over the actions and lives of the eagles. While being the matriarch's mate did not save him from their laws, Momo decided not to do anything as she knew Tenjin's actions were driven by a father's instinct to protect his child. She is also my child, and if she dies, our clan would be vulnerable. With my regressed form from egg laying, Tenjin would be the strongest eagle around. It would reduce our chances of survival. Momo reasoned. Uno, still reeling from the explosions, tried to regain her footing with Tenjin's help. How? she asked. You were so focused on attacking that you didn't notice, Renjiro continued. I turned your own aggression against you and planted my seals all over the battle. I guess this is Uno reverse. Renjiro inwardly chuckled. I concede, Uno said, her voice filled with a mixture of respect and resignation. You have proven yourself, Renjiro. She knew she had underestimated this human, and despite her frustration, she couldn't help but respect his cunning and resourcefulness. She finally lowered her head in a gesture of acknowledgement. Momo's voice held a hint of approval as she spoke. You have indeed proven yourself worthy, Renjiro. We would be glad to enter a summoning contract with you. Welcome to our clan. Renjiro bowed deeply, his body still trembling with exhaustion but his heart filled with pride. Thank you, Lady Momo. I will honor this partnership and the trust you have placed in me. Finally. Honestly, just the thought of repeating this whole process exhausted me. With the trials behind him and the summoning contract secured. Momo and he complete the required ritual with Renjiro using his blood while the eagle used one of her feathers. The contract was then finalized with Renjiro gaining information on how to perform a summoning ritual on the eagles. The contract they agreed on was the person to community which surprised Renjiro since it meant that they placed more trust in him than he expected. He was already contented with having either Tenzin or Uno as he was impressed by their strength. It was then that Momo informed him that due to his still growing chakra reserves, the only person that he would be able to summon was Uno, and that would cost him half of his reserves. I need to find a way to increase my chakra reserve to be able to summon more than one of these eagles. Moreover, they had a fast growth rate so the cost of summoning Uno was bound to increase in the future. 
Fortunately, it would not be that much as Uno was close to maturity. Can I ask a question? Renjiro asked once they finalized the summoning contract. Do ask, Renjiro, Momo said as they were on their way back to one of the caves in the mountain where they resided. When I fought Uno, I found that I could not access my chakra, I tried healing myself but nothing has changed. Was that an effect of Uno's attacks? No, Momo shook her head, it was your body's reaction after being exposed to natural energy on your way up the mountain. Don't worry, after enough rest, you will be able to access your chakra. Well, that is assuring. Rinjiro thought before asking, since you guys have access to natural energy can you guys teach me senjutsu? Momo regarded him with her sharp, discerning eyes. After a moment, she let out a sound that Renjiro could only describe as an eagle's version of a chuckle, a mix of a soft screech and a clucking sound. Are you sure, she echoed, you barely have access to your chakra, and yet you wish to learn senjutsu? Yes, I believe it would help me grow stronger and be a better partner to your clan. From how you arrived at the mountain with Tenjin, I must admit, I have my doubts about your talent in senjutsu, Momo began. While you still survived the journey, from what I have seen from you, I am sure the sole reason for your survival was your healing, is it a possibility or is it confirmed? Renjiro asked. This was something that he had been planning on doing for a while now. So when he was basically told that he might not have the talent to achieve it, it was understandable he didn't take it well. It is not confirmed, but your adverse reaction to natural energy only indicates that your body will have a hard time manipulating the energy. So there is still a chance? Renjiro asked with hope evident on his face Momo stared at Renjiro for a moment. She was still unsure of how to reply to that question. Should I just tell him bluntly or should I give him hope? Seeing the sullen look on his face, Momo's tone softened and she made a decision. Yes, there might be a chance. The only way we would be sure of the lack of talent in Senjutsu is if your body would have given in a you died. But due to your unique abilities, we would have to conduct further tests. She paused, allowing her words to sink in. Renjiro stood there, his mind racing. There's still a chance I could learn it which is good. But I need to manage my expectations. Good thing that the worst case scenario is that I have a summon who knows senjutsu which is still acceptable. Momo continued, these tests will be rigorous and demanding, but they will reveal whether you possess the talent necessary to harness natural energy. Thank you, Lady Momo. I will be willing to undergo any test you deem necessary. Weighing her next words carefully, Momo added. However, she began, for you to even be considered for senjutsu training, your chakra reserves must increase significantly. Renjiro nodded, I understand, but to what quantity exactly must my chakra reserves increase? Until when you are able to summon five eagles from our clan simultaneously, including Tenjin and Uno, only then will you be ready to learn senjutsu or at the very least confirm whether you have talent in it. Renjiro's eyes widened slightly. What? That much? She already said that in order for me to summon Uno, I would need to use half of my reserves. So being able to summon that number of eagles would require a significant amount of chakra. I'll probably need to be an S rank to command that much chakra. And the worst thing is that I need to be powerful enough to summon them without my reserves taking a large hit. So achieving that feat is only a baseline and not a target. But in hindsight, I think the requirement makes sense as S-rank shinobi rarely have ways to increase their power, so if I have a guarantee of increasing my power level at that rank, then I am good. But this all depends on me actually being able to learn senjutsu. I see. That gives me a clear goal to work towards, besides, he added with a determined smile, I'm only 11. My chakra reserves are bound to keep increasing as I grow. I'll make sure to meet your requirements. It is good to know that you plan on working hard, Renjiro. That will serve you well. Finally, they reached the entrance of a large cave. The interior was illuminated by the faint glow of bioluminescent moss covering the walls, casting an ethereal light on the surroundings. In the center of the cave was a massive wooden plank, clearly designed to accommodate the giant birds. Momo turned to Renjiro and, lie down on the wooden plank. He was aware of what Momo was to do as she had already explained it to him a while ago, so he got on the plank. She wanted to expedite his recovery process as he still could not access his chakra. Maybe there's a way I can collect this energy and incorporate it into a seal. 
It would work against a lot of shinobi. The only problem would be when I use it against a shinobi who actually has a talent for senjutsu. The sheer size of the plank dwarfed Renjiro, making him feel like a small child in comparison. Once he was settled, he gazed up at Momo, who had taken to the air and was hovering above him. She began flapping her wings slowly, and instead of generating the powerful gusts of wind Renjiro expected, he saw, through his Sharingan, a vague blue aura emanating from her wings. She's releasing chakra? The chakra congregated just above Renjiro's lying body, forming a dense, radiant cloud. As Momo continued to flap her wings, the chakra cloud began to descend, seeping into Renjiro's body. Renjiro felt an immediate, intense cold rush as the chakra entered him, causing his body to shiver involuntarily. The cold sensation was sharp and almost painful, like icy needles piercing through his veins. However, this was swiftly followed by a warm, soothing feeling that spread throughout his entire being. It overwhelmed Renjiro to the point where he could no longer keep track of what was happening around him. His senses dulled, and he felt himself drifting in and out of consciousness, unable to fully grasp the reality of his surroundings. The sensation was a result of Momo's chakra expediting the process of Renjiro's recovery. Her chakra meticulously worked to remove the residual bits of natural energy that had infiltrated his chakra network, causing the earlier disruptions and pain. The treatment went on for an entire hour and eventually, Momo's voice broke through the haze of warmth enveloping Renjiro. The process is complete, as Renjiro lay on the wooden plank, he decided to test his chakra control, but the effort was futile. Momo observed him, it will take a few hours for your chakra pathways to fully stabilize. Give it time. Renjiro nodded. Patience was not his strong suit, but he knew she was right. Once the treatment was complete, Momo instructed Tenjin to fly Renjiro down the mountain. The giant eagle nodded and gestured for Renjiro to climb onto his back. As they soared into the sky, Tenjin activated his chakra zone. This ability enveloped Renjiro in a protective field of chakra, shielding him from the intense natural energy of the mountain. These guys use chakra easily as if they are breathing in and out. Momo used her chakra to help me recover quickly, which was not even similar to medical ninjutsu, and now Tenjin is covering me with his chakra against the natural energy present. I guess my mindset in how chakra could be used was very limited. Renjiro's Sharingan activated instinctively, studying the ability Tenjin was using. It is basically like a chakra field by Tenjin seems intentional in covering me with his chakra. I wonder if it works like the Rakage Lightning Release Chakra Mode, or is it the same with Naruto sharing Kurama's chakra during the Fourth Shinobi War? Both techniques enveloped the user in a layer of chakra, providing both protection and enhanced abilities. However, Tenjin's method seemed more refined and gentle, focused on preservation rather than augmentation. Even if I don't learn Senjutsu, I need to get them to teach me this. Because the level of control required to maintain this must be immense. After a short flight, they landed on one of the nests on a floating island. Renjiro dismounted carefully. You may rest here, Tenjin said, his voice deep and resonant. Use this time to regain your strength. Renjiro nodded gratefully and found a comfortable spot to sit. The nest was enormous, so space was not an issue. It provided a surprisingly comfortable resting place. With nothing better to do, Renjiro lay back and allowed himself to drift into sleep. When he awoke, it was dusk. The sky was painted in hues of orange, pink, and purple, casting a mesmerizing glow over the floating islands. I could get used to this. Renjiro said as he took in the picturesque view. The sun was setting in the distance, its golden rays filtering through the clouds and reflecting off the surfaces of the various floating islands. Too bad I can't stay here for long. To his immense relief, he found that his connection to his chakra was fully restored. The pathways that had felt blocked and sluggish before were now clear and responsive. With his connection to his chakra reserves fully restored, Renjiro finally became acutely aware of the purity of the chakra on the floating islands. Why didn't I notice this before? Lady Momo wasn't lying when she said that the chakra here is so pure. There's a significant difference from the chakra back in Kanoha. The energy was not only abundant but also far more refined than what he was accustomed to. Even the chakra crystals don't match this purity. I wonder if there are chakra crystals here. 
If there are, I'm sure they are better than the ones the major shinobi villages receive. If there is a mine here, I can get the crystals and sell them to shinobi villages. But wait, that would just put a huge target on me. The only way to do that will be to create another identity to handle the transactions. But still, there are endless possibilities if there are chakra crystals present here. Renjiro's imagination ran wild, painting a picture of various ideas and how he could use the chakra crystals. I can even start my own organization similar to the Akatsuki. They can help me collect intel from all nations in the world to ensure that things are going according to the history that I know of. I can even revive the Uzumaki clan and begin training shinobi since I will have access to the crystals and money. But, similar to selling the crystals, it will put a huge target on me. Besides, being a clan head seems like a lot of work. Renjiro chuckled to himself at the last thought. Taking care of his responsibilities as a shinobi and officer was tiring him mentally as it is. So he could not imagine himself being responsible for a whole clan. I'm getting distracted by unnecessary thoughts. There's no need to think about this now. I first need to reach S rank to even consider any of these ideas. He shook his head, dispelling the enticing ideas. After meditating for a few minutes, the pure chakra of the floating islands not only restored his reserves but also cleared his mind, making him feel sharper and more focused. He opened his eyes slowly, before turning to Tenjin. The majestic eagle, who had been keeping him company, had also drifted into a light slumber. Tenjin, Renjiro said softly, I feel much better now. I will now return to my village. Tenjin stirred, his large, piercing eyes opening slowly. He stretched his wings slightly before focusing on Renjiro. You are feeling better, I see. That's good to hear. Renjiro nodded. Thank you for everything. I will definitely return when I have time to perform the tests for Senjutsu. Tenjin gave a nod of approval. We will be waiting for you. Remember, Renjiro, you are always welcome here. Whenever you have the time and the strength, come back, and we will continue. I will, Tenjin. With that, Renjiro activated his remaining seal. A cloud of smoke enveloped him, and in an instant, he was transported away from the floating islands back to his home. Renjiro then collapsed into a chair, as his mind veered off to thoughts and plans he had earlier made. I finally have a summon, this settles a lot of my plans. I just need to keep practicing my Fuenjutsu. If I can't learn Senjutsu, maybe I can find a way to mix it with my Fuenjutsu. The fact that exposure to it can cause harm to the body and even sever one's connection to their chakra makes it a useful weapon against shinobis. I also need to learn the Yamanaka techniques that I had planned. Reading Ohashi's mind is a priority. I'm not sure if time will degrade his memories, so I need to do this fast. I don't have many short-term plans, but I need to finish my time in the force and start working on my long-term goals. With that said, I need to go and visit Fujioka. I'm not sure if anyone came looking for me while I was away, but I need to know when I will take my squad leader mission. I don't even know how long I was away. Rinjiro glanced at the wall clock hanging in his room, I was gone for two whole days? I could have sworn it was less than a day. The realization jolted him slightly, but he quickly regained his composure. Rinjiro decided to shower first and then head to Fujioka's place. The rest he had back in the floating islands had done wonders, so after finishing up, he would head to Fujioka's place directly. Getting to Fujioka's home was straightforward for Renjiro, especially since both of them lived within the Uchiha clan compound. However, Fujioka's residence was located in the more central part of the compound, due to his position in the force. The house was built with sliding wooden doors and paper windows, creating an atmosphere of serene simplicity. A neatly kept garden surrounded the home, reflecting a sense of tranquility and discipline. Renjiro knocked on the door, and it didn't take long before a middle-aged woman opened it. Is this his wife? She exuded a mature vibe, not dressed in a shinobi's attire, yet Renjiro could sense that her chakra capacity was close to, if not more than, his own. Good evening, Renjiro greeted, bowing slightly. My name is Renjiro, and I'm here to see Fujioka-sama. The woman gave him a warm smile. Welcome, Renjiro. Please come in. She ushered him inside, Fujioka will be with you shortly, she said before leaving the room. Renjiro took a seat, taking in the surroundings. A few moments later, Renjiro heard footsteps approaching. 
The sound was accompanied by some voices. The first voice, which Renjiro immediately recognized as Fujioka's, said, No, Abito. I can't teach you more firestyle jutsu until you master the fireball jutsu. But father, replied another voice, high-pitched and full of childish impatience, I have already performed it, and you saw it. I need to learn more jutsu before my genin exams. Fujioka responded, you need to perform the jutsu with only one hand sign to consider it mastered. Just as Abito was about to reply, they entered the living room. Upon seeing Renjiro, Fujioka's demeanor relaxed. Renjiro, it's been a while. How have you been? he asked. Renjiro stood and bowed. Good evening, Fujioka-sama. I apologize for the late visit, but I have some matters to discuss. Fujioka nodded, turning to his son. Abito, we'll continue our conversation later. For now, practice your hand signs. Abito pouted slightly but nodded. Yes, father, such an innocent boy too bad he will want to watch the world ban one day. Renjiro remarked as he watched the boy leave. So how have you been? Fujioka asked. I've been well, Fujioka-sama. How about you? I've been managing. But I visited your place a couple of days ago and you weren't there. Where have you been? Renjiro paused for a moment, a carefully crafted lie forming in his mind. I've been with Kushinasan, polishing my few Injutsu skills, he replied smoothly. He didn't want anyone to know about his new summon, he had already revealed one of his abilities and it didn't go well for him. Only Miwa and Kushina knew about his plan to get a summon, and he decided not to tell them if he succeeded unless they asked him directly. Fujioka seemed satisfied with the explanation. I'm glad to see you're still honing your skills. Renjiro nodded. He was certain his lie would go undetected because the Uchiha were not welcomed around the Jinchuriki ever since Madara left the village. This was an order issued by the second Hokage, who did not want the Ninetales falling into the wrong hands. With his demise, his students, more so Danzo, ensured this policy was enforced. While I do not like Danzo, I have to understand his behavior towards the Uchiha, to some extent that is. The very child standing before me a few moments ago would cause the Ninetales to rampage in the future. I came to discuss the squad leader mission you informed me about. Fujioka sighed, leaning back slightly in his chair. You will have to wait until next month to take it, he said. Renjiro raised an eyebrow, next month? Why? While I wanted you to take the exam earlier, Sonoda suggested that you take it with other squad leader candidates, Fujioka explained. Renjiro nodded, I don't mind doing so, Fujioka continued, it will be a competition type mission. You'll be up against other candidates, and it will test not just your skills but also your ability to lead and make strategic decisions under pressure. It's not like I really want the position, I am sure I will gain access to the clan's forbidden jutsu at some point. But going up against other Uchiha clan members seems fun. I still don't mind, Renjiro said. It sounds like a good challenge. After a bit more discussion about the details of the upcoming mission and some general conversation about recent events in the village, Renjiro decided it was time to take his leave. Thank you for the information, Fujioka-sama. I will prepare accordingly. Fujioka nodded, a faint smile playing on his lips. Take care, Renjiro. We'll talk again soon. As Renjiro walked through the quiet streets of the Uchiha compound, suddenly, his stomach rumbled loudly. I almost forgot that I went all that while without eating. Where should I go to? Right, I know just the place. Realizing he was quite hungry, Renjiro decided to take a detour to the talk of the town, Ichiraku Ramen. When Renjiro reached Ichiraku Ramen, he found the shop bustling with activity. The delicious aroma of ramen filled the air, making his stomach growl even more. He waited patiently in line, observing the lively atmosphere around him. Eventually, it was his turn, and he took a seat at the counter. Tucci, who was in his mid-teens, approached him. Welcome to Ichiraku Ramen. I'm Tucci. What can I get for you today? Rinjiro returned the smile and placed his order. I'll have a large miso ramen, please. Tucci nodded and quickly got to work, leaving Renjiro to his thoughts. Wait if he is this young, will I be as old as him when canon starts? The thought made him sour but all that went away when someone took the seat beside him. Hello, Renjiro it has been a while since I last saw you, a familiar voice greeted him. 
Rinjiro turned and was surprised to see Minato there. Minato-san, it's good to see you, Renjiro replied, a genuine smile spreading across his face. Minato returned the smile. Likewise. How have you been? I've been well, Renjiro said. Just got back from some training and handling a few things with Fujioka-sama. Minato nodded, clearly interested. That sounds intense. How was the training? It was, enlightening, Renjiro said, choosing his words carefully. He didn't want to reveal too much about his recent activities. As Renjiro and Minato continued catching up, Tucci returned with Renjiro's steaming bowl of miso ramen. Here you go, one large miso ramen, Tucci said with a smile, before turning to Minato. And what can I get for you? Minato gave his order without hesitation. I'll also have a large serving of miso ramen, but with extra pork, please. Renjiro took note of Minato's order and thought to himself, I wonder if the love of miso ramen can be transferred genetically. Naruto loves miso ramen too. Breaking the silence, Renjiro commented, I didn't know you loved eating out, Minato-san. Minato chuckled at that. Yeah, a majority of my pay for missions goes to ninja weapons like kunai and eating out. Renjiro nodded in understanding. I can understand stocking up on ninja weapons. But why do you spend so much on eating out? Minato grinned sheepishly. It's always dangerous whenever I cook. Ah. A similar man of culture like me. Renjiro thought. Renjiro chuckled, that's also the case with me. The pans and pots need protecting from me. Both of them laughed heartily, causing a few customers to glance their way. Regardless, Minato said, calming down a bit, there's something comforting about eating at a place like this. It helps keep things in perspective. Renjiro nodded, yeah, it's nice to take a break and enjoy the simple things. Besides, I hear Tucci's ramen is the best. Minato agreed, absolutely. I always come here whenever I can. Their conversation continued as Tucci brought Minato's order, placing the large bowl of miso ramen with extra pork in front of him. Here you go, Minato-san. Enjoy. Thanks, Tucci, Minato said. Once Minato got his order, the two of them began to dig in. Between mouthfuls of ramen, Minato looked at Renjiro and said, I heard from Kushina that you're in the Kanoha force. How's that been for you? Renjiro took a moment to gather his thoughts before recounting the past seven months. It's been intense, to say the least. I started in a new squad, and we've been through a lot of missions together. Lost Tota and Tobe, who were not just my squad mates but became close friends. That was tough. But I was offered the position of squad leader and I'm currently preparing for the required mission to be promoted. Minato's face lit up, that's amazing, Renjiro. Congratulations. I'm sure you'll pass that mission and get promoted in no time. Renjiro felt a warm glow from Minato's encouragement. Thanks, Minato. It means a lot. Renjiro took a sip of his broth before asking, so, how about you? What have you been up to? Minato nodded, nothing much, I've just been asked by the Hokage to become a Jounin Sensei. I'm about to take a few missions in the coming months before I rest and focus on that. Renjiro feigned surprise, why did you agree to become a Jounin Sensei? He had been expecting this at some point and had even just met one of Minato's future team members. He was just surprised that it was so soon ah. No wonder Abito was pestering Fujioka about new jutsus. I guess they are finally graduating from the academy. I wish I could be allowed to see how they perform. Minato's eyes sparkled. I feel like I can really make a difference by guiding the next generation. Plus, while I'm teaching them, I might also learn something valuable from them. Renjiro couldn't help but smile at Minato's idealism. He's such a boy scout, so straightforward and glaringly good that it hurts just thinking about it. Maybe if Minato stayed longer as Hokage, things would have gotten better for Naruto and Kanoha as a whole. Maybe I can make that happen. Minato then looked at Renjiro with a curious expression. Have you ever considered becoming a Jounin Sensei yourself? Nope, I can barely guide myself, so why would I bother with some kids? But I can't say that, can I? Renjiro immediately thought, his chopsticks paused in midair. I haven't given it much thought, to be honest. My focus has been on my own training and missions. Besides, the possibility of me becoming a Jounin Sensei is too far in the future. Minato shook his head, that might not be the case. 
Right now, you're close to becoming a squad leader in the force just after joining them in less than a year. Soon, you might even be promoted to Jounin. Rinjiro smiled but shook his head. Becoming a Jounin is way harder than becoming a squad leader. It's going to take more time. Minato leaned forward, you became a Chunin earlier than I did, Renjiro. At this pace, you'll even become a Jounin earlier too. I was 13 when I made Jounin. You've got two more years to go. Yeah right, how can I compete with a peerless genius like you? The only good thing that I have going for me is that I know the future. Renjiro couldn't help but laugh, maybe. But I think I'll need every bit of those three years. Minato then asked, but after the force, what are your future plans, Renjiro? Renjiro paused, contemplating his answer. This is the second time someone else asked me that question, but I really haven't narrowed it down. Even if I did, I wouldn't tell anyone, it's better to keep them guessing. I'm not entirely sure. For now, I just want to polish my skills and become powerful enough to protect what I love, especially after experiencing the death of my squadmates. Though Renjiro's words carried a touch of exaggeration, there was a core of truth in them. He wanted to be strong enough to control his fate in this world, only then would he feel like he was living life. Hearing Renjiro's answers, Minato was visibly moved. You know, Renjiro, he began, as I earlier said, I'll be taking my last missions for a while before focusing on my duties as a Jounin sensei. How about joining me on those missions? Renjiro was pleasantly surprised. Really? That sounds great. I'd love to. Going on a mission with a future Kage, sign me up. I need to witness his capabilities directly so that I have a standard I could measure myself to. Minato nodded. It'll be good experience and training for your squad leader mission too. Intrigued, Renjiro asked, what's your team composition going to be like? Minato leaned back, tapping his chin. I haven't put much thought into it yet. But I think a five-man team will be good. I can fill all the spots except one. Do you know someone who would be free to join us? Someone? Most of the people I know of are Chunins. Renjiro considered this and asked, would a Chunin be fine? Minato agreed, yes, that would be perfect. The two continued their conversation, discussing potential strategies and missions that they could take as they finished their meal. As they were wrapping up, Minato said, once I have everything ready, I'll inform you when we'll start taking the missions. Renjiro nodded, I'll be looking forward to it. With that, Minato stood up, paid for his meal, and waved as he left the ramen shop. Take care, Renjiro. See you soon. Renjiro waved back, you too, Minato. Now alone, Renjiro began to ponder who he should recommend for the team. Now who should I ask? I feel like despite knowing a lot of people, there are only a few of them I'd trust in a mission. Wait. I think I should ask him. It's been a while since I saw him, Renjiro thought. I should probably go visit his house. With his decision made, Renjiro paid for his meal thank Tucci, and left the shop with only one location in mind. Renjiro made his way towards the northern district of Kanoha, where his friend lived. As he walked, he reflected on the person he was about to visit. It had been several months since their last meeting, and Renjiro was eager to catch up and see how he was doing. The streets became quieter as he approached his friend's area of stay. It was a residential area with traditional homes, each with its own garden and wooden gate. Renjiro walked up to a familiar house and knocked on the door. After a few moments, the door opened, revealing a young woman with striking features. She smiled warmly when she saw Renjiro. Renjiro! It's been a while. How have you been? Renjiro returned the smile. I've been well, Seiki. Is your brother home? Seiki nodded and stepped aside to let Renjiro in. Yes, he's in the training room. I'll let him know you're here. As Renjiro entered the house, he was struck by the sense of nostalgia. The house was much like Fujioka's, with sliding paper doors and tatami mats. Seiki returned shortly, accompanied by her brother, Hiro. Hiro had changed from the last time Renjiro saw him, with him becoming taller and leaner. He grinned when he saw Renjiro. Renjiro! What a surprise! Renjiro stood up and embraced his former teammate and friend. Hiro, it's good to see you. How have you been? Hiro shrugged, leading Renjiro to the sitting area. Busy with missions, as usual. But things have been good. What brings you here? 
Rinjiro took a seat and explained, I was just talking with another Jounin I know, I am not sure if you have heard of him, he is called Namikaze Minato. He's taking his last missions before focusing on being a Jounin sensei, and he asked me to join him. We need another Chunin for the team, and I thought of you. Minato? Does he mean, that, Minato? Hiro's eyes lit up with interest. Of course, I know of Minato. I know of people from our clan who have been thinking of ways they could get him married to a clan member for as long as I can remember which shows how special he is. I'd be honored to join you and Minato as it sounds like a great opportunity. Rinjiro smiled, I knew you'd be interested. It will be good to work together again. Also, if I do a good job I can get a Jounin recommendation from him and hasten the time I'm promoted, Hiro said as a smile beamed on his face. Huh? Recommendation? Rinjiro asked with a confused look on his face. What don't tell me that you don't know who Chunins are promoted to the Jounin's rank? Sighing, Hiro decided to explain, while it is still up to the Hokage to decide, we need to be recommended by some Jounins who could testify on our skills and abilities. Coughing, Renjiro said, Ooh. You meant that, I think it just slipped my mind. Seeing that Renjiro was avoiding his gaze, Hiro thought, he definitely did not change, sometimes I wonder if Renjiro was really brought up in a shinobi clan. But it is good to see that he hasn't changed much. Meanwhile, Renjiro had different thoughts, for someone who prides himself on perfect memory and knowledge of the future, I do embarrass myself by not remembering these miscellaneous details. That being said, can clan kids just abuse this by asking their parents or any other clan member to recommend them for Jounin rank? They could even be smart and ask their parents to ask their friends. There's almost a million ways how someone could abuse this system. But I guess with the Hokage being the one to actually make the promotion official, the recommendation has to be factual. The shinobi should also have some skill widely acknowledged by other Konoha shinobi, so it is up to Hiruzen in the end. But with how he has been and will deal with Danzo and Naruto, I don't think I could fully trust his decision making. Should I ask Miwa for a recommendation? That would surely shorten my path to Jounin. I think I could even get Fujioka to vouch for me. But now that I actually think about it, let me just let things play out. Even if I am promoted and do a good job, it will be a hassle because the reward for good work is more work. As Renjiro was still in his thoughts, Hiro turned to him, did Minato inform you when you would start taking the missions, he asked. Renjiro shook his head. He said he would let me know after confirming with two other shinobi. So, I'm still waiting on that. Hiro nodded, then leaned forward, have you been focusing on your training? Renjiro nodded. Yes, but between working in the force and practicing fuinjutsu, I haven't had as much time as I'd like. Hiro sighed and then replied with a sarcastic tone, too bad for you. I have been training in between taking missions with shinobi from my clan. It would be a shame if I surpassed you. Rinjiro couldn't help but laugh at Hiro's comment. His laughter caught Hiro off guard, causing him to raise an eyebrow in confusion. Why is he laughing? What's so funny? Hiro asked. Rinjiro grinned, a playful glint in his eyes. Even if I sleep continuously for the next 10 years, you still won't have a chance against me. Hiro's eye twitched. Mildly irked by Renjiro's statement, he said, All right then, how about we settle this right here and now? Let's have a spar. Renjiro's eyes widened in surprise, but a smile quickly formed on his lips. Are you serious? Hiro nodded, Yes, why not? Let's see if you are really unsurpassable. Renjiro immediately shook his head. No, he said firmly. Hiro was taken aback. No? Why not? He couldn't believe Renjiro would turn down a challenge, especially one from him. Or are you afraid, Renjiro? Hiro said, trying to taunt Renjiro. Renjiro smirked, crossing his arms over his chest. Afraid? Why should I be? If you want me to agree to a fight, you'll have to make it worth my time. So what do you want in return? Hiro asked, you are the one challenging me Hiro, you tell me, Renjiro said walking closer. Hiro took a moment to think. Then, his eyes lit up as an idea struck him. All right, how about this, we place a bet. If I win, you have to give me a lifetime supply of any three types of seals I need for free. Fuinjutsu is your speciality, after all. While Hiro was from a shinobi clan, 
His access to Fuinjutsu materials was limited as there were not many Fuinjutsu experts going around. So having access to such seals could even elevate his standing in the clan. Also, there was also the fact that Renjiro would work for him for free. Just the thought of this made Hiro happy. He was not aware, but a smile formed in his mouth when he was thinking of this. Why is this bastard smiling? Renjiro thought as he asked, and what if, no, when I win, he corrected, a confident glint in his eyes. He clearly did that on purpose. Hiro's irritation grew, but he managed to rein in his emotions. Fine, if you win, what do you want, he said emphasizing the word if. What should I ask? Renjiro thought for a moment, then replied, when I win, you will owe me a favor. You'll have to do whatever I ask, no questions asked. Frankly, I don't think that there's anything that Hiro can offer me. But since I might not really act for the good of Kanoha in the future and actually put my interests above the village, him owing me might help. I just hope he becomes an influential shinobi in the future. Hiro found the request odd but intriguing. He nodded, agreeing to the terms. Only a favor? It seems like you are already giving up before we get started. Don't worry Renjiro, there is no shame in that. In fact, I'd do the same if I was in your position. Seeing the smile on Hiro's face, something in him just snapped. I was going to go easy on him, but he needs to be taught a lesson. With the bets already decided, Renjiro and Hiro chose to head to one of the Hataki clan's training grounds. When Renjiro arrived, he was struck by the size and layout of the area. It was expansive, far larger than the training grounds of the Uchiha clan. The terrain was varied, with open fields, and dense wooded areas. The sky above was clear, and the late afternoon sun cast long shadows across the ground, adding a dramatic flair to the setting. This is bigger than the training grounds belonging to the Uchiha clan, Renjiro thought, you'd think that the Hataki clan is on par with the Uchiha clan. While both were regarded as shinobi clans from Kanoha, the Uchiha clan was one of the founding clans, while the Hataki clan had only come into prominence a couple of decades ago, with Sakumo being the second clan head after his father. The first Hokage had picked up an orphan in the Land of Iron during one of his travels. The orphan's name was Hirai, who, after being trained by Hashirama to be a proper shinobi, took on the name Hataki. It was only when he retired that the Hataki clan was acknowledged by the village as an official clan, with his son, and Sakumo's father, becoming the first clan head of the Hataki clan. Don't get me wrong, but while both clans have contributed to the village, their standings are only similar due to the chasm between the Uchiha clan and the village administration, Renjiro mused. Hiro broke Renjiro's train of thought. Are you ready? Renjiro nodded, confirming that he was. Hiro retrieved his two swords and a coin, the moment the coin touches the ground, we will begin, Hiro said. Renjiro nodded in response and retrieved his bow staff from one of his seals, disassembling it into batons before extending the blades at their ends. Hiro flipped the coin high into the air. The metallic glint caught the sunlight as it spun before descending. Renjiro prepared himself and changed his stance, shifting his focus between the coin and Hiro interchangeably. Clink! The instant it hit the ground with a soft sound, both Chunin moved with blinding speed. Whoosh! Hiro's swords cut through the air as he darted forward. Clang! Clang! Renjiro met him head-on, his batons twirling and blocking Hiro's strikes. Sparks flew from their weapons as they clashed. This is a different style than he used when we were genins. Renjiro's Sharingan spun rapidly as he analyzed Hiro's movements. Hiro's dual-wielding style was fast and aggressive, each strike aimed with deadly precision. Renjiro deflected a slash aimed at his torso, countering with a swift strike to Hiro's side. Hiro twisted his body, narrowly avoiding the blow, and retaliated with a spinning slash that Renjiro ducked under. Their movements were a blur, each trying to outmaneuver the other. The two fought across the training ground, moving from the open field to the edge of the wooded area. Hiro pressed the attack, his sword slicing through the air with relentless speed. Renjiro parried each strike, his batons a whirl of motion. Hiro was fast, but not faster than Renjiro whose dojitsu helped him in the fast transitions he was experiencing. You've gotten stronger, Renjiro remarked, his voice calm even as he blocked another flurry of strikes. Hiro grinned, his eyes blazing with intensity. I've been training hard. I'm not the same shinobi I was before. 
Rinjiro attempted to trap Hiro in a Jinjutsu, but Hiro, knowing better, consciously disrupted his chakra flow. This proved no issue for Hiro, who barely used chakra, relying almost entirely on his sword style. He retaliated with a slash aimed at Renjiro's side. Renjiro blocked the attack by combining his batons into an X shape. As Renjiro blocked, Hiro's shadow clone emerged from behind, leaping into the air while making hand signs. The shadow then exhaled a wave of water from its mouth completing his water blast jutsu. Fortunately, Renjiro had anticipated the jutsu. Hiro thought Renjiro had flickered away, but an explosion suddenly went off, throwing Hiro back while also dispelling his shadow clone. Renjiro had not flickered away but had substituted himself with a bunch of his modified explosive tags he had left lying around the moment they entered the training grounds. The blast sent Hiro sprawling, but he quickly recovered, rolling to his feet and glaring at Renjiro. The ground around them bore the marks of their clash, scorched earth from the explosion, deep gouges from Hiro's swords, and broken branches from Renjiro's evasive maneuvers. You're always full of surprises, Hiro admitted, wiping a trickle of blood from the corner of his mouth. Renjiro smirked. Well, I can't say the same. In a bold move, Hiro threw one of his swords at Renjiro. Renjiro deflected it, but the distraction allowed Hiro to close the distance. He swung his remaining sword in a powerful arc slash. Renjiro sidestepped, using his baton to redirect the blade and deliver a sharp kick to Hiro's midsection. Hiro grunted but used the momentum to spin around and slash at Renjiro's legs with his bladed baton. Renjiro jumped, narrowly avoiding the strike, and countered with a downward slash that Hiro blocked with his sword. Renjiro quickly created two shadow clones that emerged from the ground on either side behind Hiro. They immediately began spewing wind bullets from their mouths. Hiro deftly evaded the projectiles. Despite his agility, he couldn't afford to turn his back on Renjiro and face the clones. Hiro knew he was in a precarious position. If I turn my back on Renjiro, I'll be at a disadvantage, he thought. He focused on evading the wind bullets, trusting his instincts to keep him out of harm's way. However, Renjiro didn't let him breathe as he, too, began using the wind bullet jutsu, creating a barrage of projectiles from three different points. Despite Hiro's best efforts, some of the wind bullets grazed him, tearing through his clothes and leaving shallow cuts on his skin. Renjiro was holding back since this was a spar and not a lethal fight. He could have used more powerful techniques, but he chose restraint. Hiro decided to create some distance. He used the earth pillar jutsu, causing a column of earth to rise beneath him and propel him backwards. He landed a few meters away, panting slightly from the exertion. Renjiro snickered, I knew you were weak, but I never knew you were also a coward, Hiro screamed internally, struggling to maintain his composure. Renjiro's taunts were getting under his skin, and it took all his self-control to stay focused on the fight. He must have put a calm front on the outside because when Renjiro saw that Hiro wasn't reacting, he muttered, so you're just going to stand there? Fine, I was getting tired of these probing attacks anyway. Renjiro quickly formed a hand sign and unleashed the fireblast jutsu. Flames roared from his mouth, surging towards Hiro in a wave of intense heat. At the same time, the two shadow clones synchronized their efforts, using the violent wind jutsu to amplify the flames. The combined jutsu created a massive inferno, the wind feeding the fire and making it grow larger and more destructive. The ground between Renjiro and Hiro became a blazing path of fire, and the heat was nearly unbearable. Hiro's eyes widened in surprise, but he didn't panic. Why does he always resort to his fire jutsu? Doesn't he know that it is predictable? Hiro swiftly formed a series of hand signs and slammed his palms into the ground. Earth style, mud wall, he shouted. A thick wall of mud erupted from the ground, forming a barrier between him and the incoming flames. The fire crashed against the mud wall, the heat causing steam to rise as the mud hardened into a protective barrier. The fire continued to rage, but the mud wall held strong. Hiro took a deep breath and steadied himself. I can't let my guard down, he thought, Renjiro's not holding back anymore. When Renjiro saw Hiro creating the earth wall, he just mused, does he really think he could outlast me in a battle of chakra? Determined to prove his dominance, Renjiro decided to pour more chakra into the two jutsus he was using. 
The increased chakra increased the intensity of the two jutsus working in tandem. The heat and wind became more intense, which caused a web of cracks to form on the wall Hiro had created and pieces of the wall started to crumble. Seeing his wall was failing, Hiro thought, I need to contain this fast. With a determined expression, Hiro created four more shadow clones. The clones dispersed in different directions, and each of them, like Hiro, used the Earth-style, mud wall jutsu. The Earth walls surrounded Renjiro and his two shadow clones, forming a circular barrier. This confused Renjiro, who wondered, what are they trying to do? My attacks are only heading towards one direction. Hiro, noticing the puzzled look on Renjiro's face, thought with a smirk, let's see how you like it when the tables are turned. Hiro deactivated the earth wall he had been channeling chakra into, letting it crumble, and flickered away to his closest shadow clone. Renjiro, seeing that Hiro was no longer in his attack range, deactivated the fire blast and violent wind jutsus. He shifted his focus to Hiro and his shadow clone, who were rapidly making a series of hand signs. Renjiro tried to read the hand signs to prepare a jutsu to counter Hiro's next move, thinking, what is the jutsu he is planning on using? Renjiro was not well versed in earth chakra nature, but he was familiar with a number of earth nature jutsus, especially those under A rank, as he only witnessed and had not mastered most of them. It was a surprise when he didn't recognize what jutsu Hiro was about to perform. Hiro and his shadow clone completed their hand signs and slammed their hands on the ground, activating their next jutsu. The ground around Renjiro began to tremble and shift. He could feel the vibrations under his feet growing stronger by the second. The jutsu that Hiro had used was earth style, earth burial. Like a massive slab of stone, the ground Renjiro was standing on flipped over, burying him underground. The jutsu Hiro had employed was an A-rank earth barrier jutsu. It worked by utilizing the earth walls Hiro had erected to form a barrier that granted him partial manipulation of the ground within its confines. Renjiro couldn't sense any of this because the chakra in the earth walls masked Hiro's chakra spreading through the ground inside the barrier. When Hiro first came across this technique, he thought it would be useful in situations where he needed to buy some time to escape. Now, using it against Renjiro, he found it even more worthwhile. With Renjiro trapped underground, Hiro dispelled all his shadow clones and kept his hands on the ground, reinforcing the jutsu. While I cannot outlast him since he has more chakra than me, leaving him stuck underground for as long as possible will tire him out, Hiro thought. True to Hiro's words, Renjiro was already sweating. He had tried using his fire jutsus, but they only made things worse. While fire style required chakra to be activated, they also relied on the surrounding oxygen to amplify their power, thus consuming the limited oxygen Renjiro had. Turning to his wind nature jutsus didn't help either, as Hiro was reinforcing the ground above him, nullifying any damage Renjiro could inflict. The fact that my go-to chakra natures are weak against Hiro's earth chakra nature is making this harder, Renjiro thought, racking his brain for a solution. What lightning jutsu should I use? Wait. I could use that. Renjiro's mind lit up when a thought flashed through it. But I still haven't completely mastered it yet. With a resolve born of necessity, Renjiro stopped using the wind jutsu he had been attempting. He closed his eyes and focused on his chakra. This was a risky move, but it was his best shot at breaking free. When Renjiro was working on the Raisingan, he realized that the Chidori was easier to learn compared to the more advanced forms of the Raisingan. This was no surprise considering the story behind the Jutsu's conception. However, Renjiro had been focusing more on the Raisingan, so he only managed to perform the Chidori a handful of times without completely perfecting it. But with his current circumstances, he thought, using it would be the best option since it directly counters the Earth Jutsu hero is using. Renjiro began gathering chakra in his left hand, quickly transforming it into lightning nature. Chirp! 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 The high concentration of electricity produced a sound reminiscent of many birds chirping. Feeling that the chakra concentration was at a suitable level, Renjiro leapt up and struck the ground above him with the Chidori. The Chidori worked better than Renjiro expected, cutting through the ground like butter. However, the ground was too thick for Renjiro to break through in one hit. It works, but it is still not enough. If one doesn't work, let's see if two will, Renjiro thought as he began channeling chakra into both his hands, 
intending to use the Chidori with both hands. It was hard since the pain on both his hands brought by not mastering the Jutsu intensified. However, pain was not a new experience to Renjiro, so he continued channeling chakra into his hands once he was done, Renjiro leapt up again, repeating what he had done a couple of seconds before, striking the ground above him with the Chidori in both hands. The combined power of the dual Chidori was immense, and this time, the ground shattered completely, sending chunks of earth flying in all directions. Hiro, who had been reinforcing the earth above Renjiro, felt the ground tremble and saw cracks spreading rapidly. What is he doing now, he muttered, realizing that Renjiro had found a way to counter his jutsu. The earth barrier collapsed, and Renjiro emerged from the ground, lightning crackling around his hands, his eyes filled with determination. You didn't think I'd stay buried forever, did you? Renjiro said, a smirk playing on his lips. He managed to break out of my jutsu? I should have expected him to have another trick under his sleeve. I don't think I need to continue, it's already clear who the winner is. Hiro was momentarily stunned but quickly recovered. You managed to break out again. Impressive, Renjiro, he admitted. Renjiro asked, do you concede, Hiro? Hiro stood there for a moment, catching his breath. Reinforcing the ground had taken much of his stamina, I concede. You got me, Renjiro. Renjiro deactivated the Chidori still active on his hands and extended a hand to help Hiro up from his crouching position. That was better than I expected, Hiro. You almost made me break a sweat. Hiro accepted the hand and got to his feet, why are you lying, Renjiro? You are already covered in sweat. Besides, what's wrong with your hands? Is this a side effect of that jutsu? I can't believe you were this desperate to win. It was then that Renjiro realized the effect of using the Chidori on both hands, hand on his limbs. I felt the pain, but I did not pay attention to my hands, I guess I really need to master the Jutsu first before using it again. Moreover, the power behind it will increase once I master it. Renjiro chuckled and waved his hands at his former teammate, who, you mean this? It is already healing. And the only reason I was sweating was because I was underground, and it was hot. It's already healing? Hiro couldn't help but think. Turning to Renjiro he asked, have you learned medical ninjutsu? I also should if it's this effective. Maybe I can ask Aiko about it. Yeah, something like that, Renjiro remarked, as he did not want to get into the topic. Instead, he wanted to change the flow of the conversation. What was the jutsu you used to trap me underground? I could not even move well when I tried to use the headhunter jutsu. Renjiro asked. The Headhunter Jutsu was one of the widely used Earth Nature Jutsus by Kanoha Shinobi. This was because it allowed them to momentarily traverse the ground. The moment Renjiro was trapped underground, he immediately tried to use it but he soon realized that it wouldn't be effective. Hence why he resorted to breaking out of his confinement. It's called Earth Style, Earth Burial. It's an A-rank Earth Barrier Jutsu that I got to learn from the Hataki Clan Library after becoming a Chunin, Hiro explained, his enthusiasm palpable. Renjiro's eyes narrowed slightly, that's unfair. I was never given such an opportunity. I was just forced to serve in the Kanoha military force. While I did not actually need the chance, I would like to be appreciated. However, he kept his thoughts to himself and simply nodded. That's quite a privilege, it is also a crafty jutsu to know, Renjiro remarked, trying to keep his tone neutral. After talking for a while longer, Renjiro decided it was time to leave. He turned to Hiro, saying, well, I should get going, Hiro. Hiro's eyes widened in surprise. Wait, where are you going? Renjiro looked puzzled. I'm leaving. Hiro shook his head, what about the training grounds? What about them? Renjiro asked, still confused. Hiro sighed, we need to pay for it. And? Renjiro replied, still not understanding where this was going and how he was involved. You basically destroyed the ground and trees with your jutsus, so you should pay for the damage, Hiro explained. Renjiro fought the urge to facepalm. I can't believe you, Hiro. How shameless could you be? You challenge me to a fight, literally, flip the ground on me, lose, and still expect me to pay for the damages? He makes sense there. Realizing his mistake, Hiro sighed and reluctantly agreed to pay for the damages himself. Renjiro couldn't help but think, why is he acting like he did me a favor? After sorting out the payment for the training ground, 
the two friends walked back to Hiro's place. On their way, they passed several Hataki clan shinobis who were also training. Unlike the private training ground they had just used, these were open for general use by the clan members and cheaper. The air was filled with the sounds of training as Kanai hit targets, grunts as sparring partners exchanged blows and the occasional sounds of jutsus being practiced. As they continued walking, they came across a certain gray-haired young boy who seemed to be about six years old. He was diligently practicing his shuriken jutsu. His small frame moved with surprising agility as he threw the shuriken one after another. They stopped momentarily to watch a young academy student practice. The boy's gray hair fluttered as he positioned himself with a kunai, focusing intently before launching it with precision. Thunk! The kunai struck the bullseye with an unprecedented aim. Hiro, puffing out his chest with pride, commented, he is impressive, right? He reminds me of myself at his age. Renjiro couldn't help but chuckle. You were just beginning your time in the academy and could barely throw a kunai, Hiro. He muttered the words just loud enough for Hiro to hear as he started to walk away, his thoughts trailing off, as expected of a future Hokage. The young boy, sensing a few gazes on him, looked up and saw Renjiro and Hiro walking away. He thought to himself, huh? Was that big brother Hiro? But who was he with? The two Chunins continued their walk back to Hiro's house. When they arrived, Renjiro said his goodbyes to Hiro and his sister before taking his leave. It was already evening, and the sky was painted with the warm hues of the setting sun. Upon reaching home, Renjiro found a message from Minato waiting for him. It instructed him to meet at the mission center early in the morning the next day and reminded him to bring his friend. Well, that was quick. I need to prepare myself for tomorrow and the subsequent days as I am sure Minato isn't going to pick easy missions since it'll be the last few he would go on before becoming a Jounin sensei. Renjiro decided to meditate before sleeping, hoping to clear his mind and rejuvenate his spirit. As he settled into his meditation posture, he mused, it's been a long day. I have met two future Hokages and one future antagonist. However, as Renjiro began to meditate, he found himself severely disappointed. The serene experience he had on the floating island seemed unattainable here. Meditating here is now like tasting the spiciest dish and coming back to eat bland food, Renjiro thought with a sigh. The vibrant, immersive experience as well as the pure chakra in the floating islands made everything else pale in comparison. With a sense of resignation, Renjiro decided to call it a night. He knew he needed rest to be at his best for the upcoming mission. The next morning, Renjiro woke up at the first light of dawn, ready to prepare for the mission ahead. He methodically stocked up on all his seals, ensuring each one was properly organized and easily accessible. He also gathered other essential equipment, such as rations and weapons, making sure everything was in place. After a quick check to ensure he hadn't missed anything, Renjiro felt ready. I guess I should go and get Hiro. Renjiro then made his way to Hiro's house to fetch his friend. He had to wait a few minutes as Hiro hurriedly finished his own preparations. Finally, Hiro emerged, looking slightly flustered but prepared for the mission. Sorry for the wait, Renjiro, Hiro said. No problem, Renjiro replied with a reassuring smile. Let's get going. Together, they made their way to the mission center. The morning air was cool and crisp, and the village just starting to wake up. Renjiro and Hiro walked in companionable silence, both mentally preparing for the task ahead. When they arrived at the mission center, they found Minato waiting for them. He was accompanied by two other shinobis. Who might they be? Renjiro wondered when he first saw them. Good morning, Renjiro, Minato said, his voice friendly. You guys are right on time. Let me introduce you to our teammates for this mission. Minato first introduced the man beside him. This is Yano Shimura, a Jounin and one of my closest friends. We were on the same Genin team. Renjiro couldn't help but gape at the man before him. Standing at an impressive height of 6 feet 7 inches, Yano possessed a broad, muscular build that was hard to miss. His skin was tanned from countless hours spent outdoors, and his dark brown hair was neatly combed back, secured with a navy blue bandana that held his forehead protector in place. Similar to Minato, he wore a blue jumpsuit and a green flak jacket. Renjiro's first thought was that Yano looked like a giant, which was understandable since Renjiro himself was only 5 feet 7 inches and still in his preteen years. 
Yano's presence was imposing, to say the least. It's good to meet you, Yano said in a deep, rumbling voice, offering a hand to Renjiro and Hiro. Renjiro shook his hand, feeling the strength in Yano's grip. Likewise. I'm Uzumaki Renjiro. Minato then turned to the woman standing beside Yano. And this is my younger cousin, Sama Namikaze. She is a chunin, just like you too. Sama Namikaze stood at 5 feet 5 inches with a lithe, toned figure. She possessed an alluring beauty that was both striking and intimidating. Her long blonde hair was worn in a tight ponytail, revealing her forehead protector, which she wore on her delicate, pale neck. Her striking green eyes were framed by thick lashes that accentuated her expressive features. She wore a black jumpsuit and a green flak jacket adorned with Kanoha's symbol. Sama smiled politely. Nice to meet you both. Renjiro gave her a nod as he introduced himself formally, I am Uzumaki Renjiro. Sama's eyes twinkled with recognition. With that red hair, I am guessing you might be related to Kushina, right? Renjiro nodded, yes, something like that. It was not the first time Renjiro had been asked this, so he already had an answer for it. While they were not explicitly related, the fact that they were the last survivors of the Uzumaki clan bonded them. If Kushina knew of the other survivors in the other shinobi villages, I am sure she would treat them the same. Renjiro thought. Sama then turned to Hiro. And you are? Hiro nodded. I am Hiro Hataki, Renjiro and I were on the same genin team. With all the introductions done, Minato addressed the group. I'm going to choose the missions that we'll be taking. I'll be back shortly. As Minato left, the group was enveloped in an awkward silence. Renjiro glanced around, noting the tense atmosphere. He thought, from the way Yano looks, I don't think he's much of a talker. Renjiro decided to break the ice. He turned to Sama and asked, So, how long have you been a Chunin, Sama? Sama smiled, I've been a Chunin for about three years now. I'm also working towards becoming an elite Chunin. Once I complete a few more missions as a medical Nin, I should get promoted. Renjiro's mind raced. Ooh, so that's why she's here. Minato is probably helping her ascend to elite Chunin status. She is also probably my age, wait. Why am I thinking of her age? While the rank of elite Chunin was indeed prestigious, it didn't impress Renjiro much. If I wanted, I could also apply to be one. After the Magatama process, my chakra sensing has improved significantly. My chakra field and perception are stronger than ever. And my Fuinjutsu skills are getting better and better, so either of them could help me get to that rank. He considered the benefits. I don't think there are any real advantages apart from status. Besides, I'm probably close to becoming a Jounin. If I keep training hard, I might get that promotion in at most three years. Sama then turned the question back to Renjiro. What about you? How long have you guys been Chunins? Renjiro caught Hiro's eye, signaling for him to join the conversation. Hiro understood and jumped in. Both Renjiro and I became Chunins just a couple of months ago. Sama's eyes widened in surprise. They've barely been Chunins for a year, and Minato invited them to our squad? Even if Renjiro is related to Kushina, Minato wouldn't invite them without merit. They must be really talented. The conversation flowed more easily from there. They discussed their training routines, favorite techniques, and even shared some funny mission stories. Renjiro, uncharacteristically, was quite chatty, which surprised Hiro. Hiro thought, for as long as I've known Renjiro, he's never been the chatty type. Renjiro, sensing his own change, thought, it's funny. I can't explain it, but I feel like I can trust her. But that doesn't mean I'll reveal all my secrets. Just as they were continuing with their conversations, Minato returned from the mission center with a stack of parchment. Minato's expression was serious but enthusiastic. All right, I've got our missions lined up. When Renjiro saw the parchments that Minato was holding, he couldn't help but think, when he said that he was planning on completing a few missions, I thought that he meant like five missions, but that is clearly more than 20 missions. Noticing everyone focusing on the parchments in his hands, Minato addressed the group, since we are basically a new squad, I thought it would be good if we took a few low-ranked missions to work on our teamwork. Once it's up to a certain level, we can begin working on the higher level missions. That's fair. We will probably start with some bandit missions. 
It will help us to better our coordination and overall teamwork since most of us don't know each other's capabilities, Renjiro and Hiro thought simultaneously. They had both experienced similar team-building exercises in different contexts. Renjiro in the Kanoha Force and Hiro when he began taking on missions with Shinobi from his clan. Minato continued, regarding the pay, I think it's fair if everyone gets an equal share. With the number of missions I have, the pay will be good regardless. Pay? Why would it be good regardless? We're only five people, I don't think bandit missions pay that well. Or has it been long since I last took those missions? Hiro thought while Renjiro sensed something was off. Minato-sama, Renjiro began, causing everyone, even the silent Yano, to turn to him, what ranks of missions are we starting with? I have 15 B-rank missions. I could have taken more, but there were none available. As for A-rank missions, there were only 7 suitable for us, Minato innocently replied. Only 15 B-rank missions? Renjiro thought, barely processing what Minato had said. He had completed fewer than 10 B-rank missions since becoming a Chunin, and the number of A-rank missions he had participated in could be counted on one hand. Hiro was in a similar situation but had taken up more missions than Renjiro since becoming a Chunin. Calm down, Hiro, he reminded himself. Remember why we are here. Minato is close to Lord Third, so his Jounin recommendation would hold more weight. You need to impress him, even if you will be taking up more missions than you have ever done. Despite their surprise at the workload Minato had chosen, a spark of determination lit within both Chunins, urging them to challenge themselves. While it will be a hassle, it's clear that I lack enough experience in missions, so maybe this will help. Besides, everyone seems fine with it, Renjiro thought. Hiro also had similar thoughts, just go with it Hiro, no one is complaining. You will just have to challenge yourself. While both Renjiro and Hiro resigned to their fate due to a misunderstanding, even if they were aware of the truth, nothing would change. This was because it was rude to complain about the amount of work needed to be done when somebody invited you to their mission squad. Seeing that everyone was seemingly in agreement Minato said, with everyone in agreement, I think we can set out. We have at most two weeks to complete these missions, with that, the squad of two Jounins and three Chunins set off from Kanoha. Damn. They really are efficient, Renjiro couldn't help but think as they completed yet another mission under Minato's leadership. If Renjiro were asked to describe how it felt working with Minato, Sama, and Yano in one word, he would definitely say, efficient. Working on missions with the three, plus Hero, felt like being part of a well-oiled machine, with everyone perfectly playing their role to make the team function seamlessly. The missions that Minato had chosen were primarily to provide reinforcements to the borders of the Land of Fire. The only issue was that the Land of Fire was a major world power sitting on a large piece of land. This meant that if Minato and the rest were to provide reinforcements for the squads patrolling the borders, they would have to cover quite the distance. Fortunately, Minato had the foresight to narrow down the scope of the missions to the borders between the Land of Fire and three other countries. The countries were the Land of Rain, which had Amigekyur, the Land of Waterfalls, which had Takigekyur, and the Land of Hot Water, which had the Yugikyur village. Minato had picked four missions to each of these three places. Once Minato informed the squad where they would complete 12 of their B-rank missions, the first thing that came to Renjiro's mind was, well, can't he just teleport us there? That would make things easier and take less time. But with that much distance between the three border points, I'm sure it would take most of his chakra. I don't even know how the flying Raijin works or if Minato has already mastered it. Their first destination, where they were to act as reinforcements, was at the shared borders with the land of hot water. While this was on the opposite side of their other destination, the land of rain, it made sense to go there first since the land of rain and waterfalls were closer to each other. It took the team a few hours to reach the land of hot water, moving at a moderate speed. To Renjiro's gen himself, this would have been considered his fastest speed. The land of hot water was serene, with its hot springs and all, but Renjiro and the rest didn't get to enjoy this as they immediately got to work under the cover of moonlight. It was here that Renjiro and Hiro were introduced to a whole new realm of efficiency. Their first mission took only an hour to complete. While it was fair, given they had two Jounins on their side, what happened next was what gave Renjiro a surreal experience. For Renjiro, B 
Being a new member of a team usually meant that he had to catch up with the various formations and dynamics of the team. However, the case was different with Minato, Sama, and Yano. After the first mission, Renjiro and Hiro noticed that the trio built their strategies around their new additions. This was a big deal as it spoke not only of their abilities and teamwork but also of their experience and adaptability, allowing them to seamlessly integrate with people who were more or less strangers. Coupled with the fact that Hiro and Renjiro already had chemistry from working together, they were quickly able to perfectly coordinate as a team. Minato's strategies were also another factor that helped them. They were always adaptable, taking into account the strengths and weaknesses of each member. Sama's medical expertise ensured they could handle injuries swiftly, even if they got injured, since they completed their missions faster than they were injured, while Yano's strength provided a solid defense. They created a mold where Renjiro and Hiro fit perfectly into the mix. In the end, their missions in the land of hot water ended up being easier than expected. Not only did they act as reinforcements, but they were also able to end most of the skirmishes that were rising around the area. Once they had completed their tasks there, they headed to the land of waterfalls, which took them nearly a whole day, as they were essentially traveling from one end of the land of fire to the other. The situation in the land of waterfalls was more chaotic. These were harsher regions, where any attacks on the borders between the land of fire and countries from these regions, whether they were probing attacks or full-scale assaults, had more to them than met the eye. These regions encompassed countries that separated the land of fire from the land of wind and the land of earth, so any aggressions here were either sponsored by IWA or Suna. Renjiro found this normalcy of constant aggression strange at first, but he quickly got over it. The major shinobi villages had to use other parties to constantly attack each other to ensure that no one enjoyed a long period of peace. A period of peace in the shinobi world was merely an interlude to the next war, where the shinobi villages worked to arm themselves and raise their shinobi forces. Nevertheless, the squad took two days to complete their missions in the land of waterfalls. Next, they would head to the land of rain. The squad moved efficiently through the land of rain, their rain-soaked cloaks clinging to their bodies. The constant downpour was something they had to adjust to, the heavy rain drumming on their gear, providing a natural cover for their movements. It's strange, Hiro remarked, wiping water from his face. I expected more resistance. I know what you mean, Sama said, her green eyes scanning the landscape. Minato nodded. Keep your guard up. We might be in the eye of the storm. Unlike what most would expect, it was the easiest out of the three regions the squad had visited. You'd think that the fact that it had Amigakure would make things a bit harder for the squad and the Kanoha forces at large since AIM had powerful and experienced shinobi like Hanzo and Heiji, Renjiro thought. It wasn't until the situation became apparently clear that Minato explained, it is not yet proven, but there have been rumors that Amigakure is going through internal strife. It seems that some upstarts have appeared, challenging Hanzo's power. Renjiro's eyes widened as he thought, has the civil war in AIM already begun? That makes sense, it happened after the second shinobi. Hopefully, things stay on track and Yahiko dies. The missions in the land of rain involved securing strategic points and providing support to local forces. Despite the constant rain and challenging terrain, the squad completed their tasks with remarkable efficiency. The lack of a more organized resistance only made their job easier. Their last three B-rank missions all involved reconnaissance, with all of them focusing on Amigakure. The initial part of their mission was to gather intelligence on the state of affairs within Amigakure and its surrounding regions. The team successfully infiltrated the Daimyo's court, a feat that highlighted their exceptional skills and coordination. However, even this did not help them complete their mission as Amigakure was completely cut off even from the Land of Rain as a whole. Unlike other shinobi villages that maintained a subservient relationship with their country and daimyo, the situation was the exact opposite in the Land of Rain. The daimyo appeared to be at Hanzo's mercy. This unusual dynamic puzzled the team. Despite their best efforts, they couldn't gather any useful information about the reasons behind this power imbalance. We've tried everything, Sama said, her voice tinged with frustration. Hiro nodded, wiping rain from his forehead. It's like the whole village is shrouded in secrecy. Renjiro added, and with the internal strife Minato-sensei mentioned, it's even harder to get accurate information. 
Minato, who had been listening quietly, finally spoke up. We've done our best here. It's clear that the situation in Amigakure is more complex than we anticipated. Yano looked at Minato and asked, what's our next move? Minato paused, thinking carefully. While it'll be bad not to complete these missions, I don't think we can spend more time focusing on them. I don't even know why they're that low-leveled, as it requires a highly experienced shinobi and not a huge squad like the one with me to get useful information about what's happening in AIM. Anyway, I'd just have to explain this to Lord Third when I get back to the village, he thought. Let's shift our focus to our higher-ranked missions, Minato decided. We can't afford to spend more time here with our tight schedule. This is the first time where I have not completed the missions taken. But Minato is right, getting more information on AIM is going to get harder and harder in the future. Renjiro thought. As they left Amigakure, the squad headed further west into the no man's land between the land of wind and the land of earth. Renjiro, curiosity peaked, asked Minato. Why are we heading there? Minato smiled, that's where our next mission takes us, he said not divulging more information. Reaching the desolate expanse, the squad set up camp, employing a series of barriers and seals to protect themselves from the mercenaries who frequented the area. The No Man's Land was a notorious hotbed of mercenary activity, a place where might ruled in the absence of any shinobi village governing it. Minato allowed the squad a day of rest, but rather than stay idle, they all chose to focus on their training. By this point, training was not just a chore but an avenue to release their pent-up stress. Hiro, Sama, and Renjiro were currently taking a break after a rigorous training session. Renjiro, breathing heavily and wiping sweat from his brow, watched Minato continue his relentless training. How is he still going, he thought. I swear, at this point, I'm wondering whether he's a Jinchuriki or something. His stamina is wild. They had all started training at the crack of dawn, their spirits high and their energy abundant. However, it only took six hours for that energy to fizzle out. Hiro and Sama bowed out first, taking their breaks and leaving Renjiro to continue with the Jounins. Renjiro lasted longer, thanks in part to his regenerative abilities, which significantly reduced the time he needed to recover his stamina. Yet, even he had his limits. He eventually bowed out with Yano after the tenth hour, leaving Minato still at it. Walking over to where Hiro and Sama were resting, Renjiro marveled at Minato's stamina and endurance. I guess that justifies the power and standing he has and will have in Kanoha. People don't get there without hard work, even when they're insanely talented. Seeing Renjiro approach them Hiro turned to Renjiro and asked, How much do you think it'll be? Renjiro looked confused for a moment. What are you talking about? Sama chimed in, the B-rank missions that we just completed. Taking a moment to think, Renjiro finally responded, It's hard to say, but since the pay for B-rank missions is between 80,000 and 300,000 Rio, then for 12 missions that would be close to a million Rio. Hiro's eyes grew even wider. I hope that it's more. Same. Renjiro thought. While being a shinobi was indeed a noble career choice, it was also an expensive one. Everything from weapons, equipment, and rations like soldier pills to the very clothes they wore was costly. Quality equipment didn't guarantee survivability, but it definitely increased one's chances. Only shinobi with civilian dependents could live mission to mission without feeling the financial pinch. However, if any of their relatives wanted to become shinobi, the cost burden would become apparent. Shinobi from clans had it better, as they got everything they needed at a subsidized rate. A million Rio isn't much considering that we'd have to split it five ways. The more you ascend the shinobi ranks, the more expensive it gets as the quality of the overall equipment you use increases. That reminds me, I need to replace my staff since it was in bad condition after my fight with Ohashi, and using it against Hiro just made it worse. Sama, sensing Hiro's disappointment, tried to console him. Don't worry, once we complete the A-rank missions, you won't have to think about money for a while. Their conversation carried on in the fading light of the day. As the sky darkened, Minato finally finished his training session and joined them. He looked composed, despite the intense workout. The squad then gathered for a meal, which Minato had stored in his seals. For Renjiro, this was a new experience since during most missions that required extended stays away from the village, 
He had survived on soldier pill rations that helped regenerate chakra. I should probably start doing this. I should raid Tucci's shop and buy all their dishes then store them in my seals for future use. As they received their meals from Minato, they all sat down together, with Renjiro choosing to sit next to Minato. The atmosphere was relaxed a stark contrast to the earlier part of their day. As they ate, the group exchanged stories and shared laughs, the camaraderie among them growing stronger. Turning to Minato, Renjiro asked, There's a jutsu that I've seen you using, the spherical one. Where did you learn it from? Minato's face lit up, oh, you mean the ice pop inspired Nimbus Jiraiya twin world sphere? Once he said it, Minato immediately regretted it and thought, Kushina says that I should call it the Raisingan. I have to stop with the earlier name. Even if it is the cooler name. Renjiro looked confused. Huh? The what? Minato quickly corrected himself. The Rasengan. It recently got renamed. As for learning it, I'm the one who developed it. Really? Renjiro's eyes widened with interest. What was the inspiration behind it? I just pray my acting skills are that good. Of course, Renjiro was aware of the origin of the iconic Jutsu, he had even mastered it and its advanced forms. But he could not outwardly use it since it might raise some questions, so he wanted to remedy this. Minato's expression turned thoughtful. There was a time when my sensei and I faced a Jinchuriki. When I saw their tailed beast bomb, the idea popped into my head. A tailed beast bomb? Is the Raisingan that powerful? Rinjiro asked, intrigued. Minato nodded, pride evident in his voice. While it's not as powerful as a tailed beast bomb, it is an A-rank jutsu. Once I complete it, it could be close to an S-rank jutsu. So it is an incomplete jutsu? Rinjiro inquired. Minato nodded and said, at the moment, yes. I am thinking of adding different natures to it to make it more powerful. Can I see it for a minute? Renjiro asked. Though puzzled, Minato agreed and held out his palm. As Chakra began to gather, Renjiro activated his Sharingan, pretending to study it before holding out his own palm and attempting to gather Chakra. Hmm? Is he trying it? Minato thought, watching with curiosity. It took me a couple of years to complete it, he said, trying to set realistic expectations for Renjiro. It was an A-rank jutsu, it was not supposed to be that easy to learn. As if on cue, the chakra gathering in Renjiro's hand dissipated, giving Minato the validation he needed. He nodded, satisfied that his warning had registered. However, Renjiro was far from deterred. He was determined to learn this powerful jutsu Minato had demonstrated. I hope I'm not too obvious, Renjiro thought, focusing intensely. On his fifth try, he managed to successfully perform the jutsu, much to Minato's astonishment. Wow! Minato exclaimed, genuinely impressed. You actually did it. Congratulations, Renjiro. The rest of the team turned their attention to the pair, curious about the commotion. Hiro and Sama looked particularly intrigued. What did he do? Hiro asked, leaning in. He just replicated the Raisingan, Minato explained, still in awe. Renjiro's quick mastery of the Raisingan caused Minato to wonder, is the Sharingan really that powerful? Sama's eyes widened. Already? That's incredible. I have tried it numerous times but failed. Renjiro shrugged, I just followed your lead, Minato-sensei. Minato shook his head, smiling. You're being modest. I only demonstrated it. You did all the work, so how did you do it? Sama asked with wide eyes Renjiro replied, I just introduced shape manipulation to the chakra in my palm. That's it? Sama asked, not impressed while Minato nodded thoughtfully, then offered some additional advice. He was still convinced that Renjiro's Raisingan wasn't yet as powerful as it could be since he had yet to perfect it. After the discussion, he gathered everyone around. As he did, Renjiro thought, hopefully that was believable. I needed a license to use the jutsu. I could have just said I used my Sharingan to copy it, but making it sound more complex should prevent any suspicions. Once everyone had assembled, Minato addressed them, I think it is now time for us to strategize for our first A-rank mission. But first, I need you guys to have this with you. Minato reached into his pouch and drew out four strange kanais. These kanais were unlike any the team had seen before, they had intricate markings on them which Renjiro quickly recognized. Renjiro studied the special kunai Minato was handing out to each member of the squad. 
The intricate markings on the kunai signified the matrix of the seal required to operate the flying thunder god technique. It was not like Renjiro had seen the seal, he just pieced facts together. So he has already mastered it? Renjiro thought, carefully examining the kunai. But that is expected, considering he is to become a Jounin sensei in the next few months. But why do we have to waste time moving around for our B-rank missions? Chakra shouldn't have been an issue because he would have just used a day like this to regenerate it. Or was it because we were many? No, that shouldn't be the case since he has, or will, transport a whole-tailed beast bomb using the Flying Thunder God. But maybe that's because he was at Kage level and had gotten better at using the technique. Or maybe I am just overthinking and Minato was just saving it for these types of missions. Interrupting Renjiro's thoughts, Hiro asked, What is this? He looked at the kunai with a mix of curiosity and confusion. Sama gave Hiro a knowing glance, but before she could respond, Minato said, I will get to that in a minute. Turning to address the entire group, Minato explained, Our first A-rank mission is to destabilize the region. Renjiro frowned, puzzled. What do you mean by region? I mean exactly that, Minato replied. We will attack specific points in both the land of wind and the land of earth. Renjiro thought. Both the land of wind and earth? Wouldn't that be too much work? Hiro voiced Renjiro's concerns as he said, wait, wouldn't that need us to travel around both countries? It will definitely take us more than two weeks to complete this one mission. That's where the kunai come in, Sama said. Hiro, still confused and slightly irritated, asked, how will a kunai help, Sama? Although Minato had not yet explained the significance of the kunai, Hiro did not think it would play a huge role in the completion of their mission. Yes, Minato was a widely known talented shinobi in Konoha, but a part of being a shinobi required them not to expose most of their mission details in a bid to curb information leakage. So most of the civilians and other Konoha shinobi were not aware of his strengths and weaknesses. Minato-sama has a movement technique, so don't worry about getting to the destination, Renjiro said, glancing at Minato with a reassuring look. He hoped his statement would quell Hiro's incessant questions and put his worries to rest. Minato's brow furrowed slightly, how did he know about it? Did Kushina tell him, he wondered. Brushing the thought aside, Minato addressed the team. Minato nodded, yes, that's correct. These kunai are marked with seals that allow me to teleport to their location instantly using the Flying Thunder God technique. You will be carrying them, and in case of an emergency or if you need immediate assistance. He then reached into his pouch. The pouch was more symbolic than functional, as it was filled with storage seals that held his belongings as well as his kunais. After retrieving a seal, he flicked his wrist, bringing out a map and laying it in front of the group. Renjiro looked at the map, noting the marked points. It's probably a map of the land of wind and earth. The marked points you see are strategic places we need to attack, Minato began. Before he could continue, Renjiro interrupted, how will attacking the marked points destabilize the region? These are major powers in the world, wouldn't they just quickly shift their focus to recovery? Yamo, who mostly kept to himself, explained. We will be attacking the marked points in both countries at the same time, acting as the other country's shinobi. By doing so, we will be planting and watering the seeds of distrust between the two. Minato nodded, adding, yes, if these two major countries distrust each other, they will start probing each other using the surrounding weaker nations, which will eventually destabilize the whole region. Ooh, so we are just instigators? Renjiro thought but then asked aloud, but how will this help the village? Minato and Yamo exchanged glances before Minato responded, you saw all the skirmishes happening at our borders. To deal with them, the village has to issue missions, which they pay for. Eventually, it will eat into the budget the fire daimyo gives the Hokage. Shifting their focus would allow us and other Konoha shinobi some space to breathe. While he didn't show it outwardly, Yamo was a bit displeased. Minato did not have to tell them all that, he thought. They are still Chunins, they shouldn't have the privilege to have this type of information. I am starting to see why the clan head rejected his admittance to the ANBU. Hiro, trying to process the information, asked, So, we'll be disguised as Shinobi from the Land of Wind when we attack the Land of Earth, and vice versa. Exactly, Minato confirmed. This will create confusion and make each country suspect the other of plotting against them. 
After the briefing, Minato continued explaining the mission details to the squad, answering any questions they raised. The team listened attentively, absorbing every bit of information. Okay, so is everything understood? Minato asked. He received various cues from his team, nods from Hiro and Renjiro, a salute from Sama, and a grunt from Yano. Good, Minato said, satisfied with their responses. Now we need to decide on our positions. Sama and Hiro, I'll send you to the land of wind since Sama is proficient in earth nature, which is also Hiro's inherent chakra nature. Renjiro and Yano, both of you are proficient in wind nature, so I'll send you to the land of earth. Remember, we have to be discreet and act as shinobi from IWA and Suna, so use the chakra natures agreed upon. The team members nodded, understanding the importance of maintaining their cover. Minato continued, I didn't get the opportunity to place some of my seals in the capital cities of both countries, just close to the borders. I will hand you guys the map of the capital cities. Once you reach there, place the kunais in a discreet place. This is more so for Renjiro and Yano since I will be joining Sama and Hiro as I believe Yano is more than enough to keep you safe. Renjiro's thoughts raced as he listened. What a terrifying ability. I always knew this was OP, but now being here puts it into perspective. I am starting to believe that Minato was only killed at the start of the story because he was too powerful for the plot. He could go anywhere as he pleased as long as he placed a seal there. Imagine him during the Kanoha crush. First of all, I don't think Orochimaru would attack Kanoha if Minato was still the Hokage, but that's beside the point. Minato would deal with everything in a couple of minutes and even appear in Suna and exact revenge if he wanted to. But that's not his style. Regardless, I need to learn this jutsu once I get the chance. Minato looked at the group, ensuring they understood the plan. I will first transport Yano and Renjiro since the land of wind is actually closer, he said, placing his hands on Yano and Renjiro's backs. Before activating his technique, Minato did not forget to place a seal on Renjiro as he already had one on Yano. The intricate seal glowed faintly on Renjiro's shoulder, a mark of Minato's mastery over space-time ninjutsu. Ready? Minato asked. Both Yano and Renjiro nodded. With a swift movement, Minato activated the Flying Thunder God technique. As Minato activated the Flying Thunder God, Renjiro braced himself. There was a moment of disorientation as the world around him seemed to blur and twist. Colors and shapes melded into a dizzying swirl, accompanied by a faint, high-pitched whine in his ears. He felt a sensation akin to being pulled through a narrow tube at incredible speed, his body tingling with the rush of chakra. Then, just as quickly as it began, it was over. The world snapped back into focus with a soft whoosh, and Renjiro found himself standing in a completely different environment. They had arrived in what appeared to be a canyon, the towering rock walls stretching high above them and creating a narrow passageway. The ground was rough and uneven, with scattered boulders and sparse vegetation clinging to the rocky surfaces. The canyon's natural acoustics amplified every sound, making the rustling of leaves and the distant calls of birds seem closer than they were. This way more uncomfortable than when I used the summoning seals. But it is convenient, so I guess that helps. Renjiro thought as he took a moment to gather himself. Minato gave them a moment to orient themselves before speaking. You two know what to do. Be cautious and quick. I'll return for you once you've placed the kunais. Yano nodded, his expression serious. Understood. Renjiro echoed, got it. Before Minato left, he handed both Yano and Renjiro another kunai. Renjiro's brow furrowed in confusion as he accepted it. Didn't he already give us one of his kunais? Or wasn't that enough, he thought. Minato noticed Renjiro's puzzled expression and quickly explained, this is for any emergencies. Whenever a seal is placed and activated, I can feel and sense them. So I will be expecting to sense the two seals that you will place in the capital city. Once I sense a third or fourth one, then I'll know something is wrong. With that, Minato vanished, leaving Yano and Renjiro to begin their part of the mission. Renjiro turned to Yano and asked, what's next? While Renjiro knew the overall objective, he understood that Yano, being a senior shinobi, would dictate the specific tactics and strategies to achieve their goals. It was common practice for lower-ranking shinobi to defer to their more experienced counterparts, 
as their insights and decisions could mean the difference between success and failure, life and death. Taking a moment to think of their next move, Yano said, we'll head straight to the capital. But traveling alone will be risky, so we need to look for any caravans heading there and join them. Rinjiro thought, while going there might be the plan, I think attacking the marked spots across the country that we would pass on our way would make things easier. As if Yano had read Renjiro's mind, he added, if we want our plan to be effective, then we have to apply pressure to IWA. We need the Earth Daimyo to pressure him to do what we want, so what better way than to assassinate some nobles in the capital? Renjiro nodded and thought, fair enough. With that, Yano and Renjiro made their move, the Jounin taking the lead. They navigated through the rugged terrain with practiced ease. While the rocky surroundings posed some challenges, Renjiro found them manageable. I've never been to Suna or the Land of Wind as a whole, but I am sure navigating those deserts would not be as easy as it is here in the Land of Earth. As they neared the capital city, their surroundings gradually became more populated. The rocky wilderness gave way to sparse settlements and travelers on the road. It wasn't long before they spotted a caravan heading towards the capital. Yano whispered, we will have to join the caravan. Let's pick two people whose identities we can assume. Rinjiro nodded, following Yano's lead. They kept a low profile, observing the caravan from a distance. As night fell, the caravan set up camp. This was their chance. Moving silently through the darkness, they identified two merchants who seemed to be isolated from the rest of the group. They approached stealthily, knocking the merchants out with precision. They quickly stripped the merchants of their belongings, exchanging their own clothing for the merchants' attire. Rinjiro performed the transformation jutsu, morphing into the likeness of one of the merchants. Yano did the same. It was a perfect disguise, one that would allow them to blend seamlessly with the caravan. However, when Renjiro moved to hide the unconscious body of the merchant he had replaced, Yano's voice stopped him. Kill him and get rid of the body, Yano instructed. Renjiro paused, isn't that a bit much, he thought. The idea of killing the merchants felt excessive. He wasn't opposed to killing, but this felt unnecessarily brutal. Reluctantly, he carried out the order. He dispatched the merchant quickly, making sure the body was well hidden. With their disguises complete, they waited for dawn. The next day, the caravan resumed its journey towards the capital. Traveling with the caravan slowed their progress, but it provided the safest means of entering the heavily guarded city. The journey was uneventful, which was exactly what they hoped for. Renjiro maintained his role as a merchant, interacting minimally and keeping his head down. The bustling caravan provided ample cover for their infiltration. Finally, they reached the capital city. The towering walls and bustling gates loomed ahead. The guards at the gate waved the caravan through without issue, and soon they were inside the city. The plan had worked flawlessly so far. But just as Yano and Renjiro were about to break away from the caravan and proceed with their mission, they were stopped by a group of shinobi. Make way, one of the shinobi commanded. Although Yano and Renjiro were confused, they obliged without hesitation, knowing that as mere merchants, it was best not to attract any attention. Renjiro was still impressed by Yano's ability to mask his chakra so effectively. While he wasn't actively scanning for chakra signatures, Renjiro noted that Yano seemed to be an expert at erasing any trace of his presence. Renjiro himself was making sure to keep his own chakra suppressed. As they moved aside, a delegation walked past, escorted by a squad of shinobi. What caught Renjiro's eye immediately was the distinct maroon jumpsuits and green flak jackets of Iwagakure shinobi. A delegation from Iwagakure? This messes things up, he thought. The presence of more shinobi within the capital significantly complicated their mission. Moving around undetected would become much harder with the heightened security and the potential for more skilled sensors among the IWA shinobi. Renjiro knew that any misstep could now lead to immediate detection and capture. Turning to Yano, Renjiro could see that his companion shared his concerns. Yano's usually composed face was marred by a scowl that he was trying his best to conceal. Clearly, the unexpected arrival of the IWA delegation was an unwelcome development. A delegation from IWA is here, that must mean someone important is here. Who could it be? Yano wondered. Yano turned to the merchant in front of him and asked, Who are we making way for? 
The merchant, a man in his mid-forties with a weathered face and graying hair, looked surprised. Karada, did you fall and hit your head? How can you not remember that Lord Asa was coming to the capital? You were even so happy when you found out we would be arriving at the same time as him. What happened? Oh, sorry, I guess I forgot, Yano, or rather Karada, said sheepishly. Inwardly, Yano thought, out of all people, it just had to be him. This is going to be way harder than I thought. Renjiro, who was eavesdropping on the conversation, mulled over the name dropped. Asa? Why does that name sound familiar? Wait, I remember reading about him in the bingo book. He is just a high-ranking Jounin from IWA, I don't know why Yano seemed so concerned. The delegation comprised about 13 shinobi, all donning the traditional shinobi attire of Iwagakure ninjas. They surrounded two individuals at the center, who wore similar attires but with green armbands on both their arms. The distinction was subtle, but it marked their higher status. The man in the center stood at an impressive height of 5 feet 8 inches, with a lean and athletic build. His skin was a healthy tan, contrasting with his piercing indigo eyes and raven black hair, which he typically kept in a loose ponytail. He moved with an air of confidence and authority, clearly the leader of the group. He's probably Lord Asa, Renjiro thought with a pinch of sarcasm. I don't even know why they call him Lord. Maybe it's part of their culture. Clearly, Renjiro was not impressed. Or maybe he expected more from a shinobi who was nearly worshipped and was not even a kage. But his dismissive attitude changed when Asa turned his head back. Asa's eyes swept over the crowd, his gaze seeming to pierce through every person he looked at. He momentarily stopped when he laid his eyes on Renjiro. It was only a moment, but Renjiro felt a chill run down his spine. He even experienced cold sweat on his forehead. When he used his hand to feel his head, he realized he was just imagining the sweat he thought was there. What the hell was that? Renjiro thought as he tried his best to gather himself. Is there something wrong, Lord Asasama? Asa's aide, Kuriko, asked, noticing the sudden pause in his senior steps. No, Kuriko. It must have been in my head, Asa replied, his voice calm but tinged with underlying tension. Asa continued to walk, he thought, was I imagining things? No, I feel an odd chakra signature around me. Was it the guards? They are also shinobi, so that could explain it. Anyway, I need to block out all other thoughts and focus on the task ahead, the purpose of Asa's visit to the capital was to request an audience with the daimyo. The outcome of that meeting would determine the success or failure of his plans. Why am I having this weird feeling? Maybe it is because I am nervous, Asa thought stealing himself as he continued on his way. After several minutes of winding and turning through the bustling streets of the capital city of the Land of Earth, Asa and his delegation finally reached their destination. The grandeur of the Daimyu's hall loomed before them, an imposing structure that radiated authority and power. Welcome, Lord Asa. We have been waiting for you, a servant said, bowing deeply upon their arrival. I am honored to be here, Asa replied with a smile, his voice carrying the practiced warmth of a diplomat. The Daimyu is currently busy, but rest assured that he will meet you as soon as he is free, the servant said, still bowing. I can't see him now? Asa thought. It would be a lie if he were to say that he was not bothered by this. But Asa felt the weight of the power dynamics at play. I am sure he is not even busy. I don't understand why people in power like to throw their weight around like this. He is clearly making me wait to make a statement. Anyway, I need him for my plans, so I better swallow my pride, Asa mused, frustration gnawing at him. It is fine, I understand, Asa said with a slight bow. He wasn't bowing to the servant but to the idea of the daimyo that the servant represented. In the meantime, I can show you to your quarters, the servant offered, gesturing for Asa to follow. Asa and his team trailed behind the servant through the grand corridors of the daimyo's palace. The quarters they were led to were spacious but rather ordinary. The walls were adorned with simple tapestries, and the furniture, though functional, lacked the opulence one might expect in a ruler's palace. The rooms were clean and comfortable, yet devoid of any distinctive character or luxury that would make them memorable. Despite the accommodations being adequate, Asa couldn't help but feel a sense of impatience growing. How long will he make me wait, he wondered as he settled into a chair. The hours stretched on, and as the minutes ticked by, Asa decided to meditate to pass the time and calm his restless mind. 
I hope I at least get to talk to the Daimyu today, Asa thought, closing his eyes and focusing on his breathing. Time seemed to slip away as he meditated, his mind drifting into a state of calm detachment. Fortunately, the meditation proved to be an effective way to pass the time, and at dusk, Asa was interrupted by the same servant who had shown him to his quarters. Lord Asa, the Daimyu would like to see you, the servant said with a half bow. Finally, Asa thought as he stood up and followed the servant. They moved quickly through the palace, and before long, Asa found himself standing before the Earth Daimyu. Asa, it has been a long time since I have seen you. It is good to see that you have become a capable shinobi, the Daimyu greeted, his voice carrying a tone of practice politeness. Yes, Lord Daimyu, it is an honor to stand before you yet again, Asa replied with a respectful bow. Inwardly, he thought, the last time I saw you was during my father's burial. Ever since then, you never bothered with me or my family. But that is going to change. After the initial greetings, the Daimyu got straight to the point. What brings you here, Asa? Why did you request this meeting? Asa straightened, a confident smirk forming on his lips. I have come with a proposal, Lord Daimyu. A proposal? What is it about? The Daimyu inquired, his curiosity piqued. Asa's smirk widened as he replied, it is a proposal about me becoming that such a kid. The Daimyu's eyes widened slightly, and he leaned forward. Seeing this, Asa was pleased. I have his attention. The cover of the night blanketed the capital as Asa left the Daimyu's hall with a smile on his face. He had just concluded a successful talk with the Earth Daimyu, where he had passionately pleaded his case. As he made his way back to his quarters, Asa noticed two guards heading toward the Daimyu's hall. His brow furrowed momentarily, a subtle alarm sounding in his mind. But he quickly dismissed it. Perhaps just a routine patrol or a shift change, he thought, shaking off the unease. Finally, Asa reached his quarters where his team was already resting. They couldn't accompany him to the Daimyu's hall and were only there for formality. Asa knew there was no one better, even in the capital, who could provide enough security for him other than himself. His team served more as a symbol of his status than actual protection. Just as Asa was about to enter, two guards rushed up to him, calling out urgently, Lord Asa. Momentarily confused, Asa turned to face them. Upon closer inspection, he realized these were the same guards he had seen heading to the Daimyu's hall earlier. His confusion deepened. What is it? he asked. The Daimyu is requesting for you back at the hall, one of the guards said, struggling to catch his breath. Asa was surprised and instantly knew the guards were just being polite when they said the Daimyu was requesting his audience. He understood it was an order, not a request. Quickly, he followed them, his mind racing. Did he already decide on my proposal? That quick? No, with how these guards are apprehensive, something must be wrong. Maybe he changed his mind? That is also not possible because I did my best to ensure he realizes that my proposal was mutually beneficial to both of us. Upon reaching the hall, Asa found the Daimyu and his assistants who had been present a few minutes ago when he was still pleading his case. There was a new addition to the room, about five people dressed similarly to the Daimyu's assistants. The Earth Daimyu was fuming with anger as he saw Asa. Asa, I thought that you came here with good intentions. Was all this part of your plans, he bellowed. Asa was completely taken aback, not understanding what was going on or what had prompted the Daimyu's ire. He bowed deeply, Lord Daimyu, I don't know what is happening. I came to the capital to talk to you about my proposal. You see. I already said that he would come and pretend that he doesn't know what is happening, one of the Daimyu's assistants yelled, his voice shrill with accusation. This only served to confuse Asa further. What the hell are they talking about, he wondered, his mind racing to piece together the unfolding scenario. While the Daimyu was enraged, he realized that escalating this would not help them solve the current situation. Taking a deep breath, he said, you said that you only came to the capital to discuss your proposal, and yet your shinobi killed my nobles? Asa's heart skipped a beat. Shinobi? Killed nobles? The accusation hit him like a physical blow. Lord Daimyu, he began, I assure you, I have no knowledge of such an act. My men are disciplined and would never engage in such treachery without orders. There must be some misunderstanding. One of the new additions to the room, a man with sharp eyes and an authoritative demeanor, stepped forward. 
We have witnesses who saw your men leaving the scene of the crime. How do you explain that, Lord Asa? Asa's mind raced. He knew his men well, they were loyal and would not act without his command. What happened? He wondered, but he did not have the luxury to think about that as he had to put up a front and save his men regardless of what happened. If my men are involved, they did so without my orders. I would never condone such actions. Please, allow me to investigate this matter personally. Is someone pulling the strings? Asa couldn't help but wonder. Unaware, Asa was spot on. And it began once he entered the capital of the land of Earth. Are you okay? Yano, still in his Karata persona, asked as he nudged Renjiro's shoulder. Renjiro took a moment before nodding his head. What the hell was that? I've never experienced such an imposing chakra field. Even Kushina's wasn't that imposing, and she's a Jinchuriki, Renjiro thought. Closely study the IWA shinobi, Yano whispered, breaking Renjiro out of his reverie. Renjiro nodded, still absorbing the shock. After the delegation passed, the caravan moved to the accommodations they had earlier booked, which were close to the marketplace. Yano and Renjiro didn't abandon the caravan, with Ace's arrival, they had to modify their plan. The unexpected presence of a high-ranking IWA shinobi added a new layer of complexity to their mission. They didn't get a chance to do much during the day, but close to sunset, they finally got the opportunity to make a move. Who is Lord Asa? Renjiro asked once he and Yano were alone. All Renjiro knew was that Asa was a Jounin from IWA, but from how Yano was behaving, he was sure there was more to it. He is an elite Jounin from IWA, Yano began, but before Renjiro could even process the fact that Asa was an elite Jounin, which was vastly different from the average Jounin, Yano dropped another bombshell. We have recently received new reports from our spies in IWA that he is now an S-rank shinobi since he managed to take down a Jinchuriki and hand him over to the village. With him being the son of the second Tsuchikage, many think he will be the one to succeed the current Tsuchikage Anoki. Wait, what? Renjiro thought, overwhelmed by the torrent of information Yano had just dropped. He took down a Jinchuriki and his Mu's son? Surely he will see our moves from afar, but what is he doing in the capital? Renjiro wondered. So we have to be discreet, Yano said before continuing. We will both go our own ways to cover more ground. Remember to only use your wind jutsus. The nobles populate the central part of the city. With that, Yano vanished, leaving Renjiro to his thoughts. Is this the reason why IWA have two-tailed beasts? I always wondered why they had more than one, but this explains it. Asa, the name doesn't ring any bells from what I know of the future, and Anoki gave up his position as Tsuchikage after the Fourth Shinobi War, so Asa might have died in between. I've been relying on my knowledge of the future a lot, forgetting that the future depends on the present. I need to fill in all the information gaps I have, he pondered, scratching his chin. Anyway, how do I go about this? Rinjiro mused until an idea formed in his mind. He muttered, in hindsight, having IWA Shinobi in the village might actually work to our benefit. Because if we want to frame them, it would be easier. It might be unoriginal, but thank you, Naruto. Renjiro smirked as he created four shadow clones. Together with the shadow clones, Renjiro transformed into masked shinobi. With that, the five of them moved to the central part of the capital city. The noble houses were arranged in rows and columns, and Renjiro chose a column at random, deciding to begin killing anyone he could find on site. This was different from the case with the merchants because Renjiro was sure that most nobles were corrupt, or maybe that was what he told himself to deal with his conscience. Moving silently and efficiently, Renjiro and his clones infiltrated the first house. Renjiro's wind blade sliced through the air, cutting down the unsuspecting nobles with precise, deadly accuracy. Wind bullets followed, ensuring no one was left alive. Once the massacre was complete, only Renjiro himself left the scene, but his clones stayed behind. They intentionally tampered with the seals present in the houses to alarm the guards. When the guards arrived and attacked the assailants who were killing their nobles, Renjiro's shadow clones took a few hits to make the fights believable. Thud. Thwack. The clones staggered under the assault, making their injuries appear genuine before collapsing. In a cloud of smoke, the shadow clones transformed back to their disguises as IWA shinobi, making it look like the clones had reverted to their true forms. 
Double deception always works, one of Ranjiro's clones thought as it dispelled itself. Under the cover of night, the peaceful silence of Sakai Town, one of the many towns in the Land of Wind, was shattered by a frantic shout. Intruders! The voice rang out, urgent and filled with alarm. The town censors, alerted by the tampered seals on the town's walls, had immediately detected the presence of unauthorized individuals. Panic rippled through the town as guards scrambled to their positions, their feet shuffling rapidly across the ground, the sound echoing in the night air. The censors, only two in number, swiftly confirmed the intrusion. Their confirmation added a layer of urgency to the already chaotic scene as guards donned their armor and gathered their weapons to protect their town. Even the town's leader, Ri Hoki, the matriarch of the Hoki clan, was not spared from the disturbance. Ri Hoki, a formidable woman in her late forties with sharp features and an air of authority, was in her office, meticulously going through documents. Her concentration was abruptly broken when her younger sister and aide, Nori, burst into the room. Sister, we're under attack. Nori's voice was breathless, her eyes wide with panic. The Hoki family was a matrilineal shinobi clan, renowned for their medical mean prowess and skills in information gathering. They were one of the founding families of Sunagakir, entrusted with the governance of several towns in the Land of Wind, including their headquarters, Sakai Town. Unique to the Hoki clan was their all-female bloodline, a result of the biological inability of the women to give birth to male children, even when intermarried with other clans. The urgency in Nori's voice snapped Ri into action. She rose from her desk, her mind racing. As the leader of the Hoki clan, it was her duty to protect her people. The clan's reputation as elite information gatherers of Sunagakir was at stake, and any failure would bring shame upon their entire lineage. Quickly, Ri summoned a beast, a massive scorpion with a stinger dripping with poison. The beast's exoskeleton glistened under the moonlight, casting an ominous shadow. Ri mounted the scorpion and charged towards the site of the disturbance, her heart pounding in her chest. By the time she reached the location, the assailants were already disappearing. She caught a fleeting glimpse of their masked and cloaked figures just before they vanished into the night. The only distinguishing features she could remember were that two of the three figures were blonde, while the other had brown hair. Where did they go? Ri muttered, frustration creeping into her voice. She turned to her sister. Nori. Nori, understanding her sister's unspoken command, immediately activated her chakra field, her eyes closing in concentration. She expanded her senses, searching for any trace of the intruders. Seconds ticked by intense silence but to no avail. Nori opened her eyes, I can't sense them, she stuttered, her voice barely above a whisper. Ri's fists clenched in anger. How could they just disappear, she shouted. The frustration in her tone was palpable. As information gatherers of Sunagakir, the Hoki clan prided themselves on their ability to detect and prevent such situations. This failure was not just a breach of security but a direct blow to their honor and reputation. As Ri looked around at the assembled clan members, who had joined her in confronting the assailants, she sought any explanation for what had just transpired. The faces of her clan members mirrored her confusion and frustration. Surveying the scene, Ri's eyes widened in horror as she finally saw the extent of the damage to the town. Ray's heart became heavy with a mix of relief and despair. Relief, because none of her clan members or the citizens of Sakai had perished in the attack. Despair, because the infrastructure of her beloved town lay in shambles. The hospital, the school, the granaries, and the water tanks, essential facilities that kept the town running smoothly, were now buried under large mounds of earth. She took a deep breath, steadying herself. The weight of her responsibilities as the clan leader pressed down on her shoulders. She needed to stay strong for her people, to lead them through this crisis. After several minutes of gathering her thoughts, Ray finally managed to summon the strength to walk back to her office, one of the few non-residential buildings still standing in Sakai. Inside the dimly lit office, Ray retrieved a scroll and quickly penned a message detailing the attack and the dire situation in Sakai. Once the message was complete, she made a series of hand signs. With a poof of smoke, a small scorpion, no larger than the palm of her hand, appeared before her. You know what to do, she instructed. The scorpion coiled its stinger around the scroll, securing it tightly. With another puff of smoke, it vanished. I hope he gets this message early, Ray muttered. 
She knew that time was of the essence. With the message sent, she steeled herself for the daunting task ahead, remedying the situation in Sakai and restoring some semblance of normalcy to her town. Hundreds of meters away from Sakai, in the vast, windswept desert, a kunai lay lodged in the sand, almost completely covered by the shifting grains. Suddenly, three figures appeared out of thin air above it. One of the masked figures, a male, pulled back their mask and said. They almost got us this time, he remarked. Another figure, a female, removed her mask and nodded in agreement, yes, and I used a majority of my chakra this time. The third figure, also a male, took off his mask and looked at his companions, don't worry, we only have one more place to visit before we head to the capital, he reassured them. These three masked figures were Minato, Sama, and Hiro. Sakai had been the fifth village they had targeted in the last three days. Their mission was clear, to cripple the daily activities of strategic locations in the Land of Wind. While they did their best to minimize casualties, the destruction they left in their wake was substantial. As Yano and Renjiro began their work within the capital, Minato and his team took a different approach, systematically targeting key points as they made their way north towards the capital city. Minato understood the delicate balance of their mission, the land of wind's deep-rooted animosity towards Iwagakure and the land of earth as a whole meant they needed only a slight push to provoke a larger conflict. By choosing isolated towns in the south, they aimed to contain the news until it was too late for an effective response. Minato's strategy was clear, by the time they reached the capital, both Sunagakure and the daimyo would be acutely aware of the chaos unfolding. Attacking a city controlled by Sunagakure's information gatherers ensured that the Kazakage would be alerted swiftly. As they moved from town to town, Minato thought, yes, news travels fast, but we work faster. Hiro, still bent over to compose himself, struggled with the effects of Minato's teleportation technique. Despite having been teleported numerous times over the past three days, the technique still made him dizzy, a condition exacerbated by his depleted chakra reserves. The continuous use of the earth style, earth burial jutsu to sink and bury buildings had taken a toll on him. Teaching the technique to Minato and Sama had been necessary to share the burden. Sama, always focused on the mission, turned to Minato and asked, so when are we going to the next destination? Wait, she's asking about the next part, and I am here trying to catch my breath? Hiro wondered. Hiro, though annoyed by her impatience, kept his thoughts to himself. He was determined to prove his worth and refused to let the intensity of their work discourage him. We will be, Minato began, but then he abruptly stopped. His expression shifted from calm to alarmed as he sensed something off. Without another word, he vanished, leaving Hiro and Sama in a state of confusion. Hiro, not turning to Sama, asked, Sama, do you think Minato disappeared because Yano Sama and Renjiro are in danger? And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.